good to see everybody. We appreciate everybody being uh, in the back. We would put you in the front, but I think we don't have enough room. Um, we appreciate the mayor was just here. We appreciate him being here and representative of the uh, representatives of the mayor's office. Uh, I know we have most of the departments represented, if not all, and we have uh, representatives that are coming from the community foundation. I'm not sure if they're here yet. They got stuck in traffic, but um, they should be here in just a few minutes. So um, this is, um, we, and we also have some folks on the phone. Um, what the idea of this meeting was, um, or what we plan to do today, is to go around by district and determine specifically, after we've been through this for a week, what are your um, short-term needs, kind of the, the immediate needs on a short-term basis in your district, what are your, uh, the not-for-profits in your district, your individuals, your um, faith-based organizations, um, any of the groups that you're working with, particularly individual folks, what are they saying that they need at this point? And what are you saying that you need? Um, and so it's sort of gonna re work in reverse. Um, we're not hearing from public works, we're not hearing from um, codes, so this is not for them, this is for you all to tell us specifically what it is in your districts that you think you need short term and long term um, and then, um, so I'm, for the departments and for the mayor's office <clears throat> and for the community foundation, um, if you all have questions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the microphone on in the back and please come up and ask the council members questions. So this is a chance, um, and we can do this again if we need to, but this is a chance for you all to tell us what you need, all right? So, um, Obviously, when we go through situations like this, it's very important to get the communication right. Everybody's been working very, very hard and diligently to, to get this matter, to get these matters squared away. But at some point, you have to kind of sit back down and say, okay, based upon what I know at this point, this is what I'm hearing, this is what I need, so that we can help you direct resources to those areas. Does that make sense? You all good with that? All right. So uh, we're just going to go through, I'm going to give you each like five, ten minutes, take what time you need. We'll see if there's any questions, but this is your chance to kind of tell us what you need. And I figured that maybe we'd go backwards based upon numbers. So um, Mr. Taylor, I'm going to start with you uh, in District uh, 21. Um, so um, and I, I'll, I'll ask you questions if I need to, but short term, long term. What's going on in your district? What do you need? Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, so, of course, re renters' assistance is a is a huge need. We have some individuals that um, are renting. Um, unfortunately, some of those renters aren't able to connect with their landlords. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely need some help there. Um, of course, supplies, groceries, et cetera, replenishments. Um, Construction uh, for for individuals that had damage or, or, or somewhat substantial damage, uh, we'll need individuals to be able to um, to help with that. Um, we're seeing some some neighbors with without insurance um, and some neighbors that aren't getting the information. Uh, and I and, and I believe I talked to Mr. Carroll today. I, I believe we restored some of the uh, power to the community this afternoon, and so that can help. Uh, with communication, but communicating the, the efforts that are there that we have now uh, where you can find uh, some of the help that they need. Um, and <clears throat> so those are, 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 are needs immediately. W one of the other needs, uh, um, weatherheads. So if there's any damage to weatherheads uh, for restoration of, um, of power, uh, you may not have damage to your home, but you may have damage to your weather head. And, uh, and so you have to find an electrician or, or contractor to help you walk through that process of, uh, of um, fixing the damage and then going to codes, uh, and then from codes, getting a permit to complete uh, the construction, and then uh, going back to, to NES to have the electricity um, uh, restored at your home and uh, we're 
we discussed that a little bit last night. Uh, codes will be fast tracking any damage um, or any anyone any individuals that are affected by damage. Uh, but one of the one of the areas I would like to see if if we could if there is a fee with those permits, I would like to see an opportunity for that fee to be waived, specifically with the weatherheads, um, because we may have individuals that don't have uh, substantial damage to their home, uh, but as we move forward with, with, power, with power loss, that's where we see a large number of individuals that didn't have substan substantial damage, but um, those are the main reasons they're being affected the most. Okay, did you all talk yesterday or last night, because I know uh, uh, Bill Herbert was there from Codes. Um, the, the fee, is there a fee that's involved with um, getting that? I, I know there's, you don't have to pull a permit if it's just basic maintenance, but if, if there's going to be um, more structural damage, permits required and fees have to be paid? Oh, hold on, let me turn you on. Got it. You're on. So it depends on the amount of damage to the structure. So let's just take the weatherhead situation because that's one I'm hearing a lot about. Uh, so the weatherhead is existing equipment. And so you would need an electrical contractor to replace that weatherhead. But if it's replacing a, a original equipment that's already there, we're not adding anything, we're just replacing equipment, you don't need a permit to replace equipment. So you get a competent, qualified electrical contractor to do that work. That contractor then will call NES to come back and turn the power back on. When NES gets there and looks at it and sees that it's ready to go, NES will then call our electrical inspector. We have an electrical inspector stationed 24-7 in every district. So probably the electrical inspector will be there inside 15 to 20 minutes. Um, that electrical inspector will then look at the structure itself, look at the work, make sure that it's authorized, and then issue that service release to NES on the spot, and the power gets turned back on. And Mr. Herbert, these are for these are for just uh, um, homes that don't have uh, uh, substantial damage. That's correct. Okay. Good good point. So if there's substantial damage, if there's structural damage right. at all, then then all that goes out the window. This is all about those homes that just have a weatherhead issue or missing some shingles or had some windows that were blown out. Something that does not have any type of structure, a hole in the roof. Yeah, we're not going to turn the power back on. Right. But based upon our observations, if we feel like the structure is safe, then that's the process that'll work to get the power back on immediately. Thank you. Yep. So uh, let me ask you another question, Mr. Herbert. Uh, um, did you all have information like that at the meeting last night? Is there a sheet that people can see and it says, you know, maintenance work and then it says structural damage? Yes. Okay. And actually I brought, we printed up a bunch of brochures okay. that address lots of issues like that. I have stacks of them with me tonight. Okay. Happy to, I'll put them right up here. If anybody wants any, please come grab them. And uh, is it posted, is it posted on your website? Can people no, find it? No, we've just gotten these sheets. I mean, literally, okay. we just got them back from the printer this morning. Um, so we'll get as much of that on our website as we can. But we've been handing these out. The limited numbers I took to the meeting last night yeah. and to the one yesterday at noon. So we're trying to get them out to the community as quickly as possible. Okay. And, and Mr. Jameson, um, in terms of running it through the mayor's office website, can we, can we link up to that? Okay. All right. So, um, Council Member uh, Taylor, I'm looking at your stuff. Yep. You, you mentioned, um, I'm just making sure we've got it, uh, renter's assistance. Renter's you have assistance, a, yes. You have a number of people who um, were renting, and now Correct. they're displaced. Indeed. And yes. um, tell me uh, just quickly, um, you know, we, we kind of figured that most people would go to a, would find temporary sh places to go with friends or whatever. But at some point, they're going to want to, they want to go either, they want to find another place to go or why they're, they're, the place Hopefully they were renting is back, being yes. repaired. So what are they saying they need at this point? Specifically, they need assistance with rent and do they need help finding a place to so, live? Yes, assistance with, with rent, um, understanding if they should continue to pay rent um, to a landlord with, uh, with damaged property. Um, so in some cases, unfortunately, we, we can't find the landlords um, to have a conversation about what the next steps are. Um, 
And, th and that's a very small, f small few, but, but it's happening. Uh, and then also with the renter's assistance program or, or, or what we can, trying to find a, a new place for some individuals to, to find a, a home. Okay. Uh, you also mentioned neighbors need to help with just basic information. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and and it, I think, again, I think that that will, um, I think communication, uh, as we restore power, I think we can have uh, better opportunities to communicate uh, via the media as well as social media. Um, we, and as, as I mentioned, Mr. Carroll, he, uh, he mentioned today that we have restored the majority of power. I'm not sure we haven't talked here recently, but I'm not sure if we've restored everything. Uh, but uh, I know that most power has been restored to District 21. Okay. Mr. Carroll, I know you're back there. Um, I see you. Um, how much uh, in District 21? Uh, are we, are we short? Where, how, how, um, uh, do you have it? Do you have it by district about how much? How many folks are still without power in District 21? Okay. All right. Just just come on back to the back, back microphone so we can hear you. Vice Mayor, I'm going to have our Vice President of, of uh, System Operations talk about the substations and the folks that are left out in District 21. Most of the. Uh, a lot of the under, some of the Underwood area was restored last evening. A lot more of it's come on today. We're expecting it all to be on uh, either by uh, 8 p.m. this evening or first thing in the morning. Okay. All right. That's great. Um, Councilmember Taylor, um, Mr. Cooper just reminded me that um, in a typical uh, rental agreement, obviously, if you're displaced, if you can't live in your facility anymore, there are typically provisions in there that talk about that and that you're, you've been displaced, you, right. you're not yes. responsible for the rent anymore. I think what we're trying to do is figure out in those situations, particularly people who, um, and maybe this is the point, we have to find those individuals that need some assistance right. because they've been displaced, they've moved on someplace else, They're, they, need, they need help staying either in the area or someplace that may have kids that go to school in that area. Um, we need to find those people and see what we can do to provide some assistance. Perfect. And that may help for, that may be applied to everybody I, else in this. And I think it does. I mean, as we, we, we've all had a chance to all communicate throughout. Yeah. We've been working together throughout the city, uh, council members, and I think that that would apply to most districts. Um, there, some districts may be more than others, but I, I think so. Um, other, other areas, Mr. Vice Mayor, uh, uninsured and underinsured homeowners. Uh, we have a lot of those. Um, and then kind of meeting those gaps. Uh, unfortunately, in my district, I, I've heard from a few, um, and I think this is, again, getting the information uh, to FEMA and other assistance programs. There are a few people that I've heard directly from that, that have high deductibles to uh, offset a low premium right uh, for, to, for them to be able to live uh, in an ever-changing city and so we um, want to find a way to uh, manage that gap for these individuals um, and I think we have that again back to communication uh, as Mr. Carroll stated uh, once we I think once we get power back we can we can communicate these needs where they are how people can get there and uh, possibly uh, a way that they can um, have a hotline uh, to, to call. So, um, but those are some of the areas that, that we're looking into. Okay, so let me mention one other thing. Is there, um, it's very important at this point to get communication, have the right place to go. Right. Is there one centralized place that we know of that people can call to get, um, so they're calling about rental assistance and they have questions about that? I know that there's a number for legal assistance, but if you're just you're just trying to figure out a million different questions, right. do we have one centralized line to call at this point or not? Do we know? Uh, Chief Swan, just come up to the microphone. All right, Chief Swan, Fire OEM Director. Uh, one of the things that we're pushing, and I was asked to speak, if, uh, I think we talked a little bit about with some of the assistance that we're trying to make sure we get out, 
in the neighborhoods, um, not just in the traditional manners from news media and our social uh, media outlet, out, outlets, outlets, but we also are going to work closely with our partnership with TEMA and FEMA uh, closely. What we have done, and I've actually also have pamphlets uh, um, that I will hand out to everyone. It's sort of a snapshot of the beginning of the phase of this disaster that hit hit us to where we're at now. And it also have all the utilities and uh, all the work that all the, the team has played. I will not get into that because you guys know that story very well, but it does have a quick snapshot of, of then and now. But the most important factor that we're going into this recovery phase is making sure that we do get on the ground and be able to reach uh, everyone to have these questions. So currently we have three brick and mortars uh, uh, disaster uh, centers that set up uh, in three different locations. Uh, and then also working closely with TEMA uh, and now our FEMA reps, we're actually going to have FEMA representatives starting tomorrow. We have 12 of them start at with four three-man team or three-person teams, along with our urban search and rescue team, we're going to go into the effective area neighborhood and we're going to comb those neighborhoods street by street, address by address, make sure that we get, uh, they're able to sign up right there on the spot and also we're going to give out the information that have, it's a, a, a pamphlet or a leaflet that actually have a lot of more dif uh, different information, the question that you asked. I don't have that number right now with me, but what we're trying to push is to get every individual to go to these locations because when you go there, it is a one-stop shop. When right. you go, they will be able to give you all information that is needed to help you with renter support or mental health to, as I said other, the other night, even being able to plug up your phone. We understand that the impact, and this is the mayor's message, is that we want to make sure that everyone knows that we're doing everything possible to get into these areas and give the resources to the people that are needing it. And we're working closely with them, the Office of Emergency Management and Fire Police. Uh, again, we're partner with TEMA and FEMA. One mistake that uh, we're, we're, we will not repeat any mistakes that we did during the 2010 flood. We're going to make sure that we have a great partnership. We have several individuals in the back that are from TEMA and from FEMA. Uh, I've met with several of them. Um, our partnership will be strong. We will work side by side. Uh, we will not just have them going into neighborhoods not knowing where, they, where to go. We're going to escort them in these neighborhoods and be with them, and we're going to be here until this situation is taken care of. So. Perfect. Okay. No, that's outstanding. Okay. Thank you so much. So uh, the canvassing door to door will help, especially with seniors that may not have social media um, and or power restoration. And my hats off personally, uh, Chief Anderson and Chief Swan. Um, seconds after the storm, I went outdoors to uh, uh, to check my home, and then as I proceeded to walk down the street, I saw it was it was uh, uh, horrific damage that that happened throughout my community personally and i want to personally thank you guys because as i was walking those streets i saw mmpd and nfd um, side by side checking homes checking people um, so you guys did a terrific job immediately on the scene um, again uh, i was i was only a block away from from some of the the worst damage in, in my community and uh, i want to personally thank you uh, for what you all did and continue to do we appreciate that, and just knowing uh, an immediate re uh, response was done by uh, exactly with fire and police, and then the continuing um, efforts has been made by uh, everything from fire, police, and public works, NES, uh, water, and I, I, I named them list codes. I, I named them last time I was here, and I don't want to miss anybody. It's been a collective effort, so we appreciate it. Last thing I'm going to say about the partnership with FEMA and TEMA, we, um, after we do the door-to-door -door and we feel like the need is there uh, in 48 hours, I can actually ask for more. And if that need is there, we're, we will try to get a, a mobile units in place as well. So we'll have three mobile units to actually go out along with the three brick and mortars and also um, boots on the ground. So we're going to make sure we do our part. So again, I appreciate and I appreciate everybody appreciate everybody's effort and, and patience. So again, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Now, um, 
So the original question was, is there a place for somebody to call? And I believe Mr. Jamison has um, some information on that. We are still trying to focus uh, calls through Hub Nashville. Uh, for email, that's hub.nashville.gov. If you don't have access to email, it's just the 311 call. We also have the storm information, response information at the top of the home page in bright yellow line on the mayor's information page, all the directory assistance to the specific services you may need. Um, also the disaster assistance uh, centers that the chief was mentioning. And for specific renters assistance, we've been working with legal aid very well, very effectively, and they are on board. Thank you. Thank so, you. So, um, also, I'm sorry, but the 311 hub, um, we also ask in individuals to report in if they still have any roofing, uh, need it be tarped or uh, anything that needs to be boarded up. Please report that to 311 because we'll have a uh, close connection with Hands On Nashville. They can go out to those individual address. So please utilize that. Perfect. Thanks. So all needs through 311, correct? Mr. Jamison, is that right? That is the easiest one-stop shop. Perfect. If they Thank have you. a specific sense of what they need, they can get that uh, mayor's menu on the storm information Perfect. response, again, at the top of the homepage. I, I think that's the idea is if you can't remember where anything is or if you've got questions, dial 311. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. All right. And Any my last big thing is, yeah. um, uh, and, and to clarify, the meeting that we had last night was held by Equity Alliance um, and, and a few others. And... Uh, we, we, we've, <clears throat> I haven't personally, but there's been reports of individuals that um, are uh, uh, predatory development or opportunist, maybe. And, um, and so do we have anything in place? I know we can't say that you are or are not a reputable um, contractor or whatnot, but do we have anything in place uh, uh, to help those individuals? Legal aid, is that where we send them or that have already made decisions? Or so, uh, Mr. Herbert? Mike's on. So we've been working with the uh, State Department of Commerce and Insurance, and I've got an information packet that they dropped off for me up here that I'll leave out here. And so it's all about how to make sure that you're hiring a reputable state licensed contractor. It has lots of points of contact, emails, addresses, everything that the Department of Insurance and Commerce, and they're the ones who regulate the state contractors. Um, so they've brought that to us. I'll have it up here for you, and it has every piece of information. It's very, very helpful. Thank you. Yep. And, and Chief Swan, could, could that information be added to the canvassing information as, um, as OEM and TEMA and FEMA uh, canvas homes? Yeah, I'm sure it can be. We, we will actually have a, a, a sit down in the morning or probably this afternoon I can reach out to the mayor's office is actually putting together some type of flyer that has a lot of the helpful information on it. So we should be able to format that. I will get with the, um, I guess, Diane and get a little bit further instructions on it. But Thank you. And, and I, wanna, I do want to say this. Um, uh, historically, there has been an outcry from North Nashville uh, that the city may not hear them or listen to them. And I think that... Um, in this, in this effort, um, thank you from the citizens of North Nashville. Uh, the city was, was on it, um, very helpful, uh, been very helpful for me as a, as a new elected official, and I want to say thank you. And also, um, there hasn't been a day, I think, since late Tuesday evening that I haven't seen a public works truck or NES bucket truck or, or a, a cop or, or, or any, any department in Nashville. Um, they've been there, so um, thank you. I think we did a great job in responding, so hats off to everyone, and I'm proud to be a Nashvillian today. All right. Thank you, Council Member. So um, I know the Community Foundation has come in. Um, so the way this is working is um, you all are asking questions of us. We've, I know we've asked a couple of questions, gotten some answers, but do you all have any questions? Uh, anybody in the back have any questions for Council Member Taylor? Clear on what he's looking for? Okay, so um, Councilmember O'Connell is uh, sick, uh, but he's on the phone. So Councilmember O'Connell, uh, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor, and thank you for setting up the conference. Is everybody able to hear me okay? Yeah, we got you. You're on mic. Great. Um, so I'll echo uh, my colleague, Councilmember Taylor from District 21, and a couple things. One, first of all, 
thank you across the board to everybody who jumped in and responded directly across multiple metro departments. I was working most closely with NES, uh, MMPD, and Public Works and had a tremendous response. Obviously, also the community volunteers who jumped in and were ready to help their neighbors at the drop of a hat was extraordinary. I mean, we had hundreds, if not thousands, of volunteers uh, throughout the week in District 19, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. Uh, so we also had, I think, the, the characteristics of displacement we're seeing have some similarities to Councilmember Taylor's, but also some differences. On Jefferson Street and right near there, uh, we had several large multifamily structures that were damaged to the point of condemnation in some cases, which means uh, the last estimate I've heard is that we've got several hundred folks suddenly uh, immediately displaced. And the, the things that I've heard from them uh, amount to and ideally, you know, any kind of financial assistance for managing a transition where you don't know, okay, wait, am I going to get a security deposit back? Am I going to have to put down a security deposit? My next lease, if it is a short-term lease, might be uh, more expensive than my previous lease was, uh, those kinds of things. I, I know I heard the administration mention that there was uh, already an effort underway to partner with Legal Aid on that. I also heard some folks say that right now navigating uh, the housing market, uh, particularly if you wanted to stay in or near a general area, uh, can be difficult. And so I don't know if there has been any effort put into something. I, mean, this is, I know that the disaster assistance centers are a part of this uh, effort, but you know, any kind of clearinghouse for information on housing availability uh, in the areas most impacted by the tornado is a, is a big need right now. Um, so I think those were the two biggest things from a displacement perspective were just information about near-term availability of housing, including temporary housing, and then any kind of um, financial assistance that could happen along those lines. I, I got asked by a constituent, I know there has been a federal uh, extension of tax deadlines, and there was some curiosity as to whether Tennessee Department of Revenue, but also Metro Finance, uh, were going to oversee any um, extensions of deadlines related to payments by uh, both businesses and anybody else who would have local or state tax liability if any of those things were going to be extended to account for the period where things are pretty heavily disrupted uh, for the tornado. That was another one I got. And while it's not directly uh, damage related, we had two major communities uh, impacted by extended power outages, and those were Andrew Jackson Courts and uh, Cheatham Place. And we've had, again, tremendous community outpouring of support to make sure that uh, there were hot meals available during the period of power outage, but for anybody who lost uh, potentially several days of food, I know that both of those areas uh, are um, probably in some cases more in need of others because of food vulnerability and insecurity uh, of things like gift cards and similarly supplies uh, for, you know, just anything that could be perishable or um, would help with cleaning up debris, that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, Kroger and or Target gift cards and similar, I know, could be of tremendous use to people in those communities right now. Um, so, and then finally, I think, again, Councilmember Taylor mentioned this, but people who have lots of questions about uh, what form the disaster relief options might take, anything from insurance, who to report it uh, to, uh, you know, what things might be covered, when assistance might be granted, those kinds of things. And it sounds like to me the, the best thing to do for right now is to just refer as many folks as possible to the disaster assistance centers. Okay. All right. Um, um, so um, you mentioned Andrew, uh, Andrew Jackson Court and uh, Cheatham Place. Power back on there now? Yes, uh, NES did an excellent job, not just restoring power, but prioritizing vulnerable communities. And we got Andrew Jackson Courts on within just a couple of days of the power outage and Cheatham Place 
uh, you know, on also fairly soon afterwards. So credit to NES for making sure we got those communities back online. Okay, so um, Councilman, also, um, if people were interested, um, obviously, in providing some food assistance, gift cards, whatever, um, to individuals in that, um, the best way to do that is how? Check in with the main office, or what do you think? Yeah, my guess would be to check in with MDHA. Um, I know we had team leads at both sites through last week that were managing that. Uh, my main point of contact through that was, uh, I had to, I guess, Jamie Berry and Buck Dillinger at MDHA. And that would probably be the best resource right now. I know Matt Wiltshire also at MDHA uh, has been in touch. And so we, you know, we can be relatively easy to coordinate at both sites through MDHA staff contacts. Okay. So Mr. Jamison uh, or Mr. Cooper, the, if people did want to do that um, and give gift cards uh, to a particular area um, or if they were confused about that, call 311, would 311 know? So maybe people not, you know, not displaced, but people who are trying to figure out if they can give to these particular things. 311 again, is that the best thing to do? Okay. Um, one other question, council member. Uh, I did send a note to uh, the Commissioner of Revenue today to check on uh, whether there's going to be some um, um, relief in terms of, um, so I know that the federal government has come in and said people impacted would not have to file until July the 15th. I think uh, the state is looking at it and may have some information out tomorrow on that. I'm not sure okay. what they're going to do, but I think they're looking at it right now. Okay. Um, okay. Very good. All right. Anything else at this point? No, uh, am I, can I just get confirmation though that right now, if, if I'm a displaced renter, uh, you know, are, are my best options, uh, should I first go to a disaster assessment center? Should I call 311? What should sort of be my first course of action if I'm you know, trying to navigate my options? So Mr. Jamison, you can't see him, uh, is shaking his head yes. And he is uh, okay. getting out of his chair and coming to a microphone. Yes, Council McConnell, I would refer them first to the Disaster Assistance Center. I'd also note um, you should have in your inbox a memorandum from Hannah Davis, our affordable housing and housing um, expert during this particular time, and uh, especially she has compiled in one uh, memorandum all of the housing opportunities, everything from MDHA to those private vendors who have offered their vacancies, and that is updated uh, on an ongoing basis. That is available through, again, the storm relief information information that's at the top of your home page, and we can send out an updated version to the council members uh, probably tomorrow morning. Okay. All right, got it. Thank you. All right, any questions from anybody for uh, Council Member O'Connell? Any questions from in the back? All right, hope you feel better, Council Member. Thanks for getting on the phone. All right. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Mr. Vice Mayor. All right. Uh, Council Member Syracuse, I think you're next. All right, here you go. Okay, you're recognized. Thank you, Vice Mayor. All right, uh, just a few things logistically, both uh, for what, what the needs are and also for folks that may be listening who still want to volunteer. Um, the Donaldson Fellowship at on uh, McGaddock Pike, 3210 McGaddock Pike, has very much been one of the base of operations for recovery efforts. Uh, Samaritan's Purse, an organization that's just has an extraordinary logistical capabilities, um, has been just extraordinary um, as, as far as helping us out there. Every day at 7.30 a.m. and 12.30 p.m., if there are groups that still want to volunteer, and this is for all of Nashville, it's not just, not just in Donaldson, um, they are uh, accepting groups uh, who would like to volunteer at each one of those times. Um, for those that uh, one or two folks that may want to volunteer, you can still come to the Donaldson Fellowship and they will find a way to plug you in. Uh, so they are still doing that. Uh, I do encourage folks to follow the Donaldson Fellowship's uh, Facebook page because they are putting videos out there. The pastor, Tommy Swindle, is putting uh, videos out there about what specific needs are for folks that want to drop off supplies. He just did one recently about uh, cleaning supplies and whatnot. So specific items, um, you can find out that if you want to still con contribute items. Um, so um, let's see. Uh, what else? I, I don't want to 
copy anything else that somebody has said that uh, I totally agree with, but uh, Councilmember Taylor is right on. Rent and housing, there are I issues there with uh, displaced folks for, for sure. Um, I had a question and perhaps a thought about the issue with weatherheads because it's an issue that, that we deal with also. My question kind of was for NES that are, are they identifying people that uh, they can get to a certain point but they need uh, the weatherhead to be fixed in order for them to complete their job. Is there a way for us to coordinate that a little bit so that we can get, uh, so that Bill doesn't have uh, folks gallivanting across the county? Um, uh, I'm just trying to think of how we could be most efficient of, of, about that because it is certainly an issue um, in the in, in the Donaldson three neighborhoods in my district: Donaldson Hills, Maple Crest, and Lincoy Hills as well. Gosh. Just just a yeah. thought. All right, sure. have fun. Cover your cost. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, I think that was Council Member Swope. All right. Uh, Sorry, Ms. I was not muted. Oh, okay, <laughs> Mr. Harvard. Yeah, that was not me, Vice Mayor. I, I understand, Councilmember O'Connell. All right, M Mr. Herbert. We've been working with NES very, very closely. We've had multiple conversations through the mayor's office even today. So what we're trying to, we, we have kind of what amounts to is an agreement. And so if NES, it, they're the ones who are getting the poles back up, getting the power reestablished. And when they have it, when, when they're looking at a structure and if they don't see any physical damage, anything that would raise a concern, then our, our, our agreement is simply that if NES doesn't see anything and they're, and they're okay with getting the power to the pole, then they are authorized to go ahead and sit, get power into the house. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, an ongoing kind of working relationship with NES and they've been very, very, very helpful to us uh, because Every single time that if we have to send an electrical inspector to authorize the reconnect, um, we don't have the capability, we don't have the staffing levels to do that. Exactly. Yeah. So, so NES has been very instrumental and I want to I want to thank them because they've really stepped for up for us and we really do appreciate it and it expedites things. If there's physical damage to the house, if they can see, all bets are off at that point. Uh, and NES is uh, in the back. Uh, just just to uh, bring up the point, we've sent our meter crews out in advance of the of the actual construction crews, and we've been trying to meet with homeowners and tell them in advance if they were going to need an electrician or not, so that we didn't get the power restored to the neighborhood, and then the, for the customer to find out that then they've got another day or two to get an electrician. So we've been trying to be proactive about that and uh, let our customers know again in advance if they were going to need an electrician or not. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, let's see. Obviously, next week is spring break. Um, uh, uh, Two Rivers Middle School is um, a, uh, a point of uh, uh, a place where they have a food pantry that, that helps feed a lot of kids, not just at Two Rivers Middle, but uh, at any school around there. Um, with um, cur current events, uh, they have gotten that food out to exactly where it needs to go, but it has left the, that pantry uh, empty. Um, kudos to the new Post 88 uh, on McCampbell Avenue in, in Donaldson that today uh, just brought to Rivers Middle School a lot of uh, food and supplies. So for, for folks that are wanting to, to also give back, I would say uh, follow up with Two Rivers Middle School, follow up with me. Um, if you'd like to donate to that pantry, because that helps feed a lot of kids, and we're going to make sure that those kids are taken care of during spring break. Okay, and that's at Two Rivers Middle? Two Rivers Middle. Okay. I think that's what I've got for now. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So uh, just to go back, um, everybody keeps talking about uh, rent and housing assistance. That seems to main, be the main focus, okay? Um, and if, um, let me ask you this, uh, and it, uh, if, if people need that type of help, we can find them. Is there, we know who's been displaced. I mean, is there a way to get in touch with people if they're not calling in themselves? Is there a centralized system to be able to figure out who these folks are and just kind of check on them, see what's happened to them? Short answer is no. Yeah. Um, that's the difficulty, right? Is that a lot of folks have been displaced and where are they? They're not necessarily checking in uh, with us, but I know that um, the Donaldson Fellowship is getting a lot of folks to walk up and say, 
I'm in this hotel, but I'm running out of money, and I have two more days or whatnot. Um, it, so that is a need. Um, th that, that is certainly need. I, I, you know, it, if I could suggest perhaps the hospitality industry um, in a coordinated way, maybe could uh, step up and offer uh, opportunities there. Um, that would be very helpful. Okay, so I know, I know that there has been some stepping up. I think um, the concern is exactly that. Uh, and so what does uh, Donaldson Fellowship, do? I mean, what do they do? What are they doing at this point? If somebody comes up and says, I've been displaced, I've been at a hotel, but I'm running short of funds, sure. what's, the, what's the answer at this point? Um, direct uh, injection of cash or gift cards is something that I think a lot of folks need as they've been displaced also, so that they can meet their own uh, short-term needs. Um, the churches um, are, are, are giving their own money um, in, in the area to, to those individuals as they come up and, and uh, they assess their needs and, and, and help them out. Um, there is, um, I, I will mention, um, stay tuned again for folks who perhaps want to donate cash. Um, the Donaldson Gateway Project, 501c3 in, in the Donaldson area, during the flood 10 years ago, uh, had a fund called the Gateway to Recovery. And so that fund still exists. What's left of it, there's about $1,000 left in that account. Um, we are going to start hopefully building that up again soon and starting to help those immediate needs uh, for folks who, who are displaced. Um, how do you identify those? Um, well, perhaps with this announcement, um, we, we can start to ask folks to let us know. How can we help you with those immediate needs that, that, can, that can get you through? Mr. Vice Mayor, this is Council Member O'Connell again. Are we maintaining any kind of displacement registry or, you know, tornado impact registry? So I'm looking, I'm not seeing anybody shaking their heads at this point. Uh, Mr. Jameson is get, getting ready to get on the uh, mic again. I don't know. I'm going to text Hannah Davis, who could not uh, be with us at the moment, and find out if she's maintaining the registry. The hub, of course, does maintain all identifying information by particular need, and so as a default mechanism, we'll have that. But let me find out from Ms. Davis, okay. hopefully before the end of this meeting, where we are with the registry. All right. So I would recommend both uh, to all of you, um, if so just being out there, you know where your centers are, and I know there's going to be you know, additional, uh, things are going to combine into one if there's several, but um, you may want to reach out to the folks that are running those facilities, the places where people would go, and see if they can start making sure that they get a kind of a comprehensive list, that list that they can then um, probably share with the mayor's office. So we have one centralized list of people who have been displaced so we can be checking on them and figuring out what they need. Okay. Councilmember Porterfield. Thank, thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, to add to the information about the hub, it only gives you the opportunity to request um, a hands-on volunteer damage sign, tree removal, or power line down. So it, it's not anything in particular that says that an individual has been displaced. So if that could be added or captured some type of way. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Councilman Roden, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Thanks for putting this together. I, my first question, I think, is I, I'm getting a lot of calls, uh, Stanford Estates area and the Albee Drive area. We got a lot of homes that were completely destroyed. But what's amazing is there are homes within the destroyed homes that are still standing and look like they weren't touched. Uh, a lot of those folks have been calling me, asking me when can they expect to get their power back. I don't have an answer for them. They want to live in their home but they look beside them and there's nothing left on both sides. I was wanting NES if they could just give me a little information on what do I tell those people. I just want to be able to give them an answer other than I don't know. NES? Uh, I'll have to look exactly to see where that is, to know exactly where the problem is is y'all have been doing a great job i'm not saying you're not doing know. a great job but there's just so many homes but then there's a few that are just scattered that they're still standing and you could probably connect to them i just don't know if you can or not that's my that's yeah i will i'll take a note of that and go back and look back really all of the large areas where there's massive damage uh we were expecting to get power back to all of those that can receive power uh by the end of the today or by midday tomorrow 
uh, really with the exception of the Shelby Bottoms area, and that may be as, as late as the next day. So that's, in general, that's where we are. Okay, and I guess this question is both for you and Public Works. It kind of goes together. Over in Stanford Estates, and I'm not exaggerating, Public Works knows this, there are piles of debris six feet wide, eight feet tall, and they look like they're in the areas where y'all would put poles. Is, is that an issue? We, we have been working with Public Works to get some of that cleared where it is. We, we've got equipment. We'll, we'll get it out of the way if we need it out of the way. We're, we're not letting that stop us from setting poles. And um, another issue, oh, I see Ms. Smith running up. Councilmember, I just want to let you know that if you'll let Antonio or me know those specific addresses, we'll provide some more detail. And I just want you to know that Antonio has been great this week. Every time I've called Antonio, and I said that last night from the Donaldson Hermitage meeting, every time I've called, he's called me right back, and what I've ever asked him, he's got my answers, and he's got it taken care of. So Thank you so much for letting me know. You're welcome. But we had some area, we had some areas today out there that we were hitting really hard, so we're hoping that this may be one of them. We're hoping by the end of the day or midday tomorrow. Um, and I'm just kind of relaying questions that I've, I've gotten on my head since I've got you up. This might be a TVA question, but there are, there are very large pieces of poles that are resting against other poles. I'm assuming they're bound down in some fashion. A lot of people were saying, all these poles that are up against other poles, if another, if a wind comes, are those big poles going to blow over in the street? I said, I don't know. I'm assuming they've got them strapped down. Some, cause you know, what they've done is taken the poles that were in the street and the new poles that they put up, they've just kind of attached them to them and they're kind of hanging there. And I just want to make sure that's all. Yes, I'm, we, uh, us and TVA have, have made those safe. That's all. I'm sure y'all did. But I just wanted to make sure okay. I get those Thanks. kind of questions all the time. So, thank you. Um, so that was my NES questions. I've got a, okay. I've got a lot of these. But... Um, I think public works uh, I'm trying to get broader because I have the same issues I got renters assistance I have a lot of subsidized housing I think that is the biggest issue for me is that there's a lot of subsidized housing that has been destroyed and no one knows where to go for subsidized housing and I don't know where to send them and I think the disaster relief would be with with FEMA or TEMA or MDHA but they don't know who to contact and to be quite honest we don't even know if there's any subsidized housing available we do know, as council people, we do know once it gets destroyed, that housing that I have in my area that was so inexpensive, it's not going to be inexpensive anymore. It will not be subsidized housing anymore. Where can they go after this happens? So I think that is the biggest question I really need answered. Where can I send these people who don't have the incomes and have been receiving this help from government? They're not going to have it anymore in my district. They just You can't build houses that cheap anymore. So these were all built in the 60s and 70s, very before, very affordable rental units. They're not there anymore. So um, that's just part of the area that got taken out and happened with Erin, and she can tell you about hers as well. So um, this and, is- this and, and do you know who these people, can you find these people? I, a few of them I can, to be quite honest. I was told today, I didn't even know it. Some of them are actually living in their cars in front of their house because they don't have anywhere to go. And so um, we're gonna go check on them. Okay. So, um, I have, um, I, like I said, we had another issue that I've got, and there's nothing you can do about it, but I think that maybe the mayor's office of neighborhoods, this is something that they could do for us, or me personally. I have so many churches that are wanting to help, but I can't answer them all. It's, 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 it's overwhelming. I need the churches to consolidate. They need to pick a place. I need the mayor's office to, to get in charge of that. I can't do it. I need the mayor's office to call, the Office of Neighborhoods to call these churches and say, look, which one of y'all do want to be the hub? You know, we've got some, we, in my area, DCA is, I think their students are in several of my churches out there because they're putting them up for the next six months to a year. So those churches are going over and, you know, above and beyond what they need to be doing. But I just need to make sure all the donations that are coming into churches, some churches can't, they don't have the staffs to staff all those donations or to give them out or keep the doors open. So we need to be able to put signs up, but they, it's really hard to get all the churches to come together at one time. We just had a meeting a little while ago with about 50 churches from Donaldson and Hermitage, and they're all wanting to help. I'm hoping that that was a start, but if the Office of Neighborhoods could kind of take charge and reach out to them all and say, okay, where are we going to take all this stuff? For Obviously, we have a disaster relief unit out in Hermitage. It's a good location, but even on Saturday, I think everybody knows they stopped taking donations because they couldn't take any more. So uh, I don't know what we actually need other than like Jeff was saying and Brandon was saying, 
we need gift cards for a lot of these renters and people who are displaced to actually go and live, you know, have places to go live. So that's, that's one of the bigger things. Um, the other thing is more of a broader, no one's mentioned it yet, but for me, um, a large, I have a large segment of my population that used, believe it or not, the Greenway to bike to downtown when it, in the warmer weather. And this is a conservative estimate. We lost at least a thousand trees in Ravenwood Park alone, Stanford Estates, all the way up and down the Greenway, and it's all over the Greenway. And I know this is something that I don't think you want to hear from, from parks is here, but Public Works usually helps parks um, clear all that, and they have so much to clear right now. I was going to tell them, I said, they don't have time to clear the big neighborhoods. Like, my neighborhood has debris all over it. I don't know when they'll get to my neighborhood. I don't know when I can tell them that Public Works is going to get there. But these are bigger and wider. These are for the people who are not directly impacted by the storm, but they have debris or they can't use their parks or they, these are all things that the city has to do. It's just, it, it takes a lot of city services. And obviously I'm just telling you things that we need out in my area. And I don't, you know, we have things that are more important, but this is also, you know, as you broaden out from where it actually was, was destroyed, a lot of people are affected by things they can't do with city services now. So I just want to make, make you aware of that. All right. So if, if, if people have problems with trees back in their in their yard, if uh, if they see places where trees needs to be removed, three one one again, Mr. Jameson, should they uh, should they call Public Works or is it better to call three one one and then you disperse the information? It's better to centralize this to three one one. And if I can update um, a previous answer, I've just heard back from Hannah Davis. The memo regarding all of the home uh, housing resources was just updated yesterday, Monday. So you should have that, and I will make sure it's recirculated tonight uh, by email to council members. As far as the registry, Hannah has been working with four different nonprofit community groups that have all put together uh, four different registries, and she's compiling that uh, so as not to miss any of those that have been displaced and, and maintain the complete registry. Okay. All right. Thank you. And Mr. Sorderman's in the back. We're uh, at Public Works. We're working with the Parks Department. They've actually helped us from the beginning uh, in setting up some of our sites. It's not the priority, like you said, but we are aware of the problems that they have. We're going to try to clear the greenways and some of the other stuff as well. So. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I'm sure I could have 20 questions after I put this microphone down, but thank you for listening to me. Sure. If, if you've got additional questions, pass them to Councilmember Withers. But... Um, um, we're all in this together. We're going to stay with this until we get this um, until we get these things um, addressed. All right, um, Council Member Evans. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor, for calling this meeting. Um, so I think a lot of the information that I have to share it probably echoes um, much of what has been shared so far. But I think uh, you know in my area I have um, Meridian and you know apartments that you visited. And, um, you know, so with over 200 families that have been displaced, I, the people are starting to come forward that are now expressly saying, hey, I need help. I need to find a, a new place to live. I'm staying with a friend or family member or whatever. And so um, I know several people have been through Metro Social Services, have been to the Hermitage Community Center and, you know, entered um, kind of their system that way. Uh, when I, I was over there on Saturday, they did say that most people who had been through had been from Meridian. Um, but what the kind of unique cases that I'm having come forward where they're calling me directly is, is speaking to specific issues related to like I have a criminal record, where can I go, you know, that will accept me? Or I have uh, an eviction on my file, you know, where can I go that will accept me? And so that's going to be the biggest thing. They all want three-bedroom apartments because they have children. Mm -hmm. And they, of course, they want to stay in the area because we're almost at the tail end of the school year. So it's a little awkward to start pulling your kids out of school or, or moving to a different city as a result. Um, so related to are we capturing those people, of course, I think with Meridian, yes, we can get that information and know exactly um, who was displaced um, through Elmington. Um, uh, the other neighbor, other two neighborhoods where they were harder hit, um, the Valley Grove neighborhood, um, Forest Ridge Drive really um, was decimated. And I know, and I guess one question I have, because I haven't heard the latest on this, is kind of related to Forest Ridge Drive. I think partially people may have some power back. Um, but I know, of course, there were so many houses that were too damaged where they're not going to have power back. So, you know, it doesn't have to be immediate. But maybe, Antonio, I could ask you after 
um, if all, if the, if the homes were, that are livable, if the power is back in those homes. Um, in particular on, on Forest Ridge Drive, kind of talking about what Councilman Taylor was discussing, um, you know, I will say that is a, it's a road that if uh, people are renting, they're renting from a slumlord and we are not finding who those people are, or they have still accepted rent for this month and have not reimbursed people. And, um, and so in the end, you know, we've got some challenges there with those folks. Um, with, uh, between Meridian, well, in particular with Valley Grove, um, because those are longer term residents who have lived in the area for a long time, um, finding more support for uh, groceries or food or gift cards like uh, Councilman Syracuse was talking about, um, because I'm finding more people that, you know, they've gotten a lot of donations, but they're diabetic and so they can't eat chips and all that other stuff. They need, they need things that are a little bit more tailored for them specifically. And then, um, of course, uh, Margaret Robertson apartments, um, like Jeff was speaking to, or I'm sorry, Kevin was speaking to about some of the subsidized housing. That's a subsidized um, housing complex. Uh, MDHA has been very helpful. Matt Wilshire has been super helpful at getting us information, but we're also looking for from him um, and the private ownership group of the buildings that were destroyed over there. There were three buildings. Um, how can we make sure that the people that are now sitting with a housing voucher in a hotel, that we can go and provide them with assistance that they need? So it's not just the folks that are there on site, that it's the people that um, have been displaced as well. And so um, I understand from MDHA specifically for that apartment that they're working on getting the, um, I forget what Matt called it, but it was the federal housing designation, the um, disaster um, mm -hmm. from HUD. So that way then they could put those folks at the top of the line to get them into new um, places. Um, and so I haven't heard the latest on that, but that's what he shared with me yesterday. And then I also have um, uh, kind of transportation has become an issue because we don't have uh, really that much to speak of in the way of bus service. And so like Meridian, people lived in Meridian and then they would walk to that Kroger to go to work, which is reopened. But of course, if they're not living there, they don't have a car to be able to get there. So many people's cars were destroyed. Um, and then at the same time, uh, with uh, Margaret Robertson, people walking to work or, or you know, needing to get access and, and we're finding some things like construction degree, debris, you know, being on the roads um, from where the buildings are, um, like with Meridian and Margaret Robertson, where people just like, you know, they got tired or they got nails in their tires and they need to get new tires or replacement tires. And so there's some of those things. So, but groceries for sure, gift cards, we're definitely moving away from people needing toilet paper and things like that, you know, they need money or rental assistance and a, a plan to move forward. And also the grace, I think, of the city when it comes to, hey, you may not normally meet my rental standards, but I'll make an exception for a certain period of time or whatever to kind of expand some of that market. So that's where I am. Okay, that's um, very helpful. Um, so do you all know if, I mean, something as simple as a nail in a tire, if it has to be, if the tire has to be replaced, caused by this, is there any reimbursement for that or is that gonna come from your insurance? Or do we know? I don't think we know. Okay. I mean, if something were to, ha I mean, obviously, know. you know, if you lose a, t you know, if you lose a tire, sometimes maybe it'll be picked up. But if it's caused by this, is that a reimbursable right, expense? Okay. So maybe not. All right. But maybe we should check on that, particularly if we've got people who are displaced like that. And uh, Councilmember Evans, I don't know. I mean, it sounds like particularly like if it's a meridian and they, they've had to be, they were displaced and now they're looking for transportation, we don't know where they went, right? Right, but I think unlike maybe some of the other examples that we've heard so far about displacement, at least we, you know, meridian had, a, they had a way to communicate with people and so we can get that okay. ability to communicate. That's what's important on yeah. that one. Yeah, and so okay. I texted, um, uh, uh, Blair over there to ask, hey, have you thought, can we, you know, leverage your list and, you know, could we use that as if we go towards this whole displacement registry? Okay. Okay. Thank and then, you. And that's then same helpful. with MDHA, you know, that's what I've asked for. And then with, uh, with Valley Grove, it gets a little bit more complicated, but at least those folks are, um, it's a smaller area and more neighbors know each other. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any questions from the back or in the front uh, for Council Member Evans? Okay, uh, Council Member Withers, you recognize. Thank you so much, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, oh, hold on, hold on, I got a question in the back. 
Uh, not really a question. Uh, Lonnie Wade with Social Services on behalf of uh, our director, uh, Renee Pratt. Um, as it relates to individuals who may be displaced, if they have uh, criminal records, uh, evictions or anything like that that may prevent them from you know getting housing that's one of the things that we do uh, case management to work with people uh, to find housing um, this is one of the places I know for certain that they're waiving deposits uh, waiving application fees as well as not doing background checks Whispering Oaks is one place um, so definitely if you have you know constituents who are looking for housing they're a good place to go. They do have availability. They're actually offering same day move in. So, you know, there are no income restrictions or anything like that, uh, as well as Freeman Webb. Um, they're a large uh, housing uh, realty uh, organization. So same thing, they're not doing any background checks, but um, just some of the things that are off the top of my head. But if you are able to get the uh, constituents to come to the disaster relief center, we have our staff uh, located out there. We're still offering our case management. Unfortunately, we're not in our uh, direct building at this time. We were impacted by the tornado, but we're hoping to be back in there soon. Um, but even then, if they can get to one of the three disaster relief centers, we still have our staff out there. We're taking information, following up with people, still providing our case management so that you know we can work with the constituents as well to help them get back on their feet. So. All right, thank, can you get your information to all these council members? Because they may all need your information. Sure, I can okay. tell you right now. You, you say it on the phone, and um, or say it on the microphone, and, and you may get lots of calls. All right, go ahead. All right, 615, uh, let me pull up my cell phone. 615-345-5555. Okay, and uh, give me your name again. If you don't Bonnie mind. Wade. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wade. Okay. Good. Councilmember Evans, anything? Yeah. Here you go. Okay. One other thing I forgot to mention, kind of talking about um, the faith based community and their organization. So I know there's kind of a groundswell of uh, churches that I've spoken to that are really interested in moving forward with that level of organization because of the um, resources that they're all getting. But I know there's uh, missionary. Evans Hill Missionary Baptist Church, uh, which is in my area, um, that specifically there's one gentleman there named Juan Adams who's trying to drive some of that activity across all the churches so that way they can have a schedule of, like, this uh, you know, this night you can go and get dinner at this church and, and have a rotation so that way it's more organized because there's uh, been waste, you know, because people are making donations of fresh things and then it doesn't get used. So anyway, there's, I think there's uh, momentum if uh, the mayor's office is, you know, is able to move forward on that. That's somebody that I could connect to in my area that would also, I think, be really interested in helping drive that All right. process. All right, that's helpful too, thank you. Okay, um, Council Member Withers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, I, I think the, I had an opportunity this morning to have a conversation with Tim Walker from Metro Historic, and obviously um, we have unique zoning in East Nashville because of our many historic districts, which adds a little bit of a layer of complexity, but also of, I would say, quality review um, uh, in, in building and repairs and rebuilding. Um, but one of the things that Tim Walker, uh, Director Tim Walker from Historic, uh, shared with me that I hadn't necessarily thought of a whole lot, um, even though I personally grew up in a town that had tornadoes that hit the same houses repeatedly, um, but is that um, even in the 1998 tornado, and Director Walker was, was here at that time, even in the 98 tornado, you know, we can get a tarp on a roof and it may hold for a little while, but even at that time, uh, there was or there became such a labor shortage to repair or rebuild houses that it was um, months to some, in some cases, years before all of that work really was completed. And so the tarps are a very much a, a Band-Aid uh, for now. Um, but um, I guess a concern that I have that we need to think about as a city is that um, unlike 1998, um, even unlike the 2010 flood, which uh, also affected some of these very same people who have been hit by the 98 tornado and the flood and now another tornado, um, 
But something that we need to maybe think about is that with our very tight housing market, our very expensive housing market, and our impossibly tight labor market, is to say realistically, how long is it going to take to get some of these home, home repairs made for houses that are salvageable or to get new structures constructed? Um, I just want to sell the black the crews aren't going to be here, you know, building new houses next week necessarily. Um, however, to that point, um, I do have uh, Pastor Joe Drake, who's uh, with our fantastic Nazarene uh, community, and he's been uh, connecting me and some of the other council members uh, affected with um, resources that are, are coming to town to help with some of those repairs. Um, and uh, I guess what I would say is that for, for that kind of work, that definitely needs to be something that the mayor's office needs to take on, uh, because I think council members are we're still, you know, kind of triaging life safety and making sure that meals get to people appropriately, and we're we're trying to take care of people. Um, and the if the city has a housing department, uh, no matter how understaffed, but if, if the city has that and can um, direct resources like that appropriately, that that is something that we really need the mayor's office to take over, so that these volunteers that have construction equipment, tools, appropriate skills um, can be directed as efficiently as possible to those folks and also can help communicate to homeowners about how to get signed up for it. Um, even for myself, I know like I, I try to limit my social media posts to one a day to say like this is what you need to know for today. But on social media channels, there's just a flood of, of posts that are going all the time. And so that's a very important, those are very important phone numbers and resources to have, but just with this flood of all this information that folks are getting, it, it might get lost even for council members in our own communication. So I would really appreciate it. And Pastor uh, Joe is, is here as well as I think Sabrina from the Nazarenes. But if, if we could get them connected to the mayor's office and help get that information in a central location so that those resources are deployed as efficiently as possible, that would be great. I think Mr. Jameson wants to talk to Pastor Joe. Uh, through the miracle of technology, Hannah Davis asked that I tell you that Hands on Nashville does exactly that service today. So we'll get more information to you in writing uh, by email. It'll be probably in the morning, but we'll get that to all the council members together with a housing information update. I, I appreciate that, but um, again, this is my understanding, this isn't so much a denominational thing as it is uh, like a national network of folks. And so if a specific outreach could be made for that, because we do have folks that are coming into town and Hands on Nashville is fantastic, but folks have even had difficulty getting to Hands on Nashville sometimes because of, again, the surge of information. So I just want to make sure that that contact is made so that homeowners can contact an organization that is ready to help uh, and those resources can be lined up and deployed appropriately. So that's number one. Yeah. Um, with, um, with power being restored in East Nashville, which is fantastic, um, we are, there are some, some problems that uh, having road closure, closures actually helped that are gonna now be a problem, which is that with Main Street reopened, uh, with other streets now being reopened, um, we are gonna have more and more opportunities for folks to come into the community that may not always have uh, everyone's best interest in mind. And so, you know, uh, I, I really think of Main Street where we're, gonna, where we're gonna have, there's just so much decimation of buildings that we're gonna have major thoroughfares where the street lights are inadequate even when they work, even before a tornado. Um, and just having pedestrians uh, and cars interacting in that area is an immense safety concern on a good day before the tornado. And so I just want to make sure that we as a city are really prepared for some of those corridors that um, it may not be the, the best use necessarily of police officers' time long term to monitor those intersections. And so we may need to either get additional or more appropriate lighting in place. Um, or, or some other resources to sort of, uh, you know, kind of keep people out of harm's way. Um, but I, I suspect the same is probably true for Jefferson and maybe some of these other quarters where just having people move in and out of areas with often poor lighting and a lot of dangerous building sites nearby uh, is an invitation to trouble. Chief uh, Anderson, do you, do you have any comments on that? Or any questions for, um, I know what you're talking about, yeah.
So certainly at this point, our mission is to keep areas safe and to sort of pave the way for NES Public Works to get the work done. So uh, we, we are trying to collapse all of those fixed points that we possibly can uh, at this point. But nevertheless, if there's an area uh, where our presence would make a difference, please let me know and we'll evaluate it and we'll try to keep people there. Right now, we're, uh, I think you know that we've had our officers on 12-hour shifts, uh, no days off. And it's worked well, but it's beginning to wear on them. I need, I need to get to a position where I can at least give some days off. Uh, but we will stay on the task as long as necessary. So please, uh, to, to anyone, uh, let us know if there are particular areas that need the police presence for those very purposes, and we'll evaluate it. Well, I, and I appreciate, Chief, and Chief, I really appreciate you mentioning the, the fatigue of the officers who are fantastic. But um, I guess, again, I'm going to go back to the point that I made at the beginning, which is that some of these areas are going to be construction sites for two years, and it's not feasible <laughs> to have police officers deployed kind of standing guard for that long of a period of time. And so there, there, we as a city might need to have a plan in place over and above relying upon individual property owners to fence them off or stuff like that. But we might really need to think about how we can keep our sidewalks safe um, so that we can get pedestrians in and out. Because again, I mean, on Main Street, it's one of our main areas where we have pedestrian fatalities. That's without construction sites and without you know, without power outages, but like it's it's a dangerous street for cars and pedestrians um, all the time. And so uh, that's an area where I think that we need additional lighting. I mean, just like immediately. We've needed it for a long time, frankly, but uh, I, I think it's gonna become an immediate need with increased traffic returning um, amidst uh, a, a major construction zone that is poorly lit by the city. Um, uh, I think I, you're, you're asking for more lighting. More on, lighting. I mean, yeah. just just lighting on Main Street would be helpful because the lighting that we had is already so inadequate that it we have problems yeah. as a result of lighting from just a safety standpoint, and, even and, even and before that. And as I assume you can get us locations, uh, probably Main Street. Main Woodland. Street. <laughs> yeah. okay. James Robertson Parkway and Main Street, yeah. all the way to East High. That is the location. Um, so um, <laughs> um, also. Uh, another similarly complex issue, I, I guess, for um, for five points is it's vitally important that we get these businesses open as quickly as we can. Um, East Nashville is full of small businesses. Uh, every day that they're closed is uh, potentially threatening to their long-term survival, um, uh, not only for the business owners, but also for the employees. And I know we have some, some things going on in town that get folks uh, in the service and hospitality industry redirected temporarily, but we do need to get that back open, but um, I do have some concerns about um, uh, Some of these business districts probably Jefferson Street as well uh, I'd be interested to hear Council Member O'Connell's thoughts But you know sort of having tragedy tourism as I call it uh, be uh, a, a, An issue in some of those areas which is really going to strain um, social social fabric, I guess I would say, in our community. It, it's complex because we need, in these business districts, we need the press, we need the social media coverage, we need people to, we need the tourism, frankly, uh, so that those businesses can get back on their feet and get employees paid. Um, but we also need to, as a city, just try to figure out how do we manage that so that it, it uh, isn't um, kind of a circus of people treating our our employees like their zoo animals, or our residents and like their zoo animals. So just, just want to put that out there. I don't have a, a solid answer, but it's something that I worry about. Um, I'm going to go back to historic. So um, the Metro Historic Zoning Commission, uh, I spoke when I spoke with Director Tim Walker this morning, for some of these areas in the eastern, particularly the easternmost end of Lachlan Springs, there are so few buildings that are going to be left standing that we are going to maybe have to reevaluate what historic context looks like and design guidelines, you know, what context really means for some of those areas. And so I am going to work with the Metro Historic Zoning Commission uh, to maybe have some uh, town, you know, like a town hall for kind of some of those focused areas. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll update codes about that as that goes along, but we may need to take another look at some of that stuff for some areas where so many houses have been removed, unfortunately. Um, 
I have, I do have a large percentage of constituents in District 6 who have degrees or advanced degrees and experience in engineering, architecture, and things of that nature. I have had some inquiries about are we as a city going to look at what our code's requirements are as they pertain to being able to withstand storm damage? And I, you know, that is a discussion that is just starting, but I don't know if, if the codes department has any thoughts about that. Are, are we, do we feel that the codes that we have currently adopted are safe enough that we built to where we, if we build things back, they would withstand storms or, or do we need to revisit that? We're currently operating under the 2012 edition of the International Residential Code and the International Building Code. And um, we are going to be bringing um, legislation forward in the not too distant future um, to move to the 2018 version of those codes. Now, there's some differences um, in the wind load um, that's allowed in those two codes. Currently under the 2012, uh, it allows uh, for uh, 90 mile an hour wind load uh, for three seconds. Under the 2018, it goes up to 115 miles per hour. So it's up, it's up a bit. Now, is that going to um, address an F3 tornado? I don't think so. Um, but more to answer your question, we, we are gonna be moving forward with adoption of the 2018 codes. Um, it, this has been in the works for, for quite a while and we've right. been working with Mr. Jameson and the mayor's office about that. So that's, that's coming in the not too distant future. We do amendments or council may amend those codes. So it'll be up to council's prerogative as to what amendments that may want to be brought to those 2018 codes. Okay, thank you, that's, that's very helpful. Um, uh, so, um, I'm very tremendously fortunate that um, my district six neighborhoods are so um, well organized, at least on a, on a social level or as a group level. Um, for the uh, gift cards that were generously raised for us by the Convention and Visitors Corporation, you know, they called me and they said, you know, what's a good organization that is close to the ground that knows how to knows the needs of neighbors. Um, for a lot of that, I've deferred over to the Lachlan Springs Neighborhood Association. Just want to put that out there. If you have a District 6 question about how to, how to allocate funds or do fundraising, um, the Lachlan Springs Neighborhood Association is the area that it is the most impacted, uh, as well as um, in terms of number of structures and, and things like that. It also, uh, the Lachlan Springs Neighborhood Association are also is a 501c3. They have their paperwork up to date, which not all neighborhood associations do. They have a robust board that already evaluates grants from the fundraising that they do, and in fact, they write grants to Metro Government for Shelby Park all the time. So um, for anyone who needs to know about uh, who to call for District 6 help, uh, either for indiv individual neighbors or for fundraising or gift cards or things like that, please contact the Lachlan Springs Neighborhood Association. And is that, the, is that for stuff like rental assistance and other things as well? Yeah, I mean, like, if, if people if, if people in the mayor's office or in other departments want to know, like, particularly for the Five Points area, uh, you know, who, who needs help, I would say call the Lachlan Springs Neighborhood Association. They're also adept at doing fundraising um, and uh, grant distribution. Okay, but, but do you know um, in your area the people who've been displaced, where they've gone, and, and do they need rental assistance help as well? I mean, some of the people I know were renting, they, they didn't own their homes. Right, um, the other, but I'm gonna come back to that. The other group, the other area that was heavily impacted is the Rosebank area and uh, a lot of electrical power work is being done there. That organization is also very robust, very tight knit community. Um, so again, if folks can't get a hold of me for whatever reason and wanna help folks in that area or assess what the needs are, uh, you can contact the Rosebank Neighbors Association. Um, but in terms of displacement, um, we are, you know, again, pretty fortunate in uh, that we have a very high homeownership rate among the area that was affected. And so while there is displacement in some cases, typically it is a homeowner and they do have insurance. Um, and um, so they may have some stress at the short term, but I, I don't anticipate that I'm gonna have displacement like some of my 
colleagues do who have larger amounts of apartments that were affected. It was mostly single family homes, even if they're renting. A lot of times the landlords in District 6 live, you know, they might, they might have um, moved up to Inglewood or something like that, but a lot of our homeowners, uh, property owners for rental properties also live nearby. Usually we're able to get in touch with them pretty, pretty quickly. And I, again, I'm tremendously fortunate for that, that I did not have uh, apartment complexes that were damaged enough to really cause displacement. So I'm, I'm very fortunate there. Um, for individuals who are needing to move out of their houses, we've already got um, uh, in, in the realtor community in East Nashville, we already have uh, folks in the real estate community identifying, you know, who has apartments or day dues uh, or short-term rental space that they that is available, and they are making those available. Um, so our our East Nashville community is is probably more uh, going to come out better uh, at at addressing the displacement issue than some other neighborhoods would. So not to say it's not an issue at all, but I, I feel like the focus for displacement um, needs to be in the North Nashville and probably Donaldson Hermitage area from the city standpoint. Although we will certainly let the city let the city and, and Hannah or someone else from Metro know if if we do come up with folks who who need a rental assistance and can't find it. Okay. Um, well, major, major point as well, and I appreciate Chief Swan being here. Um, we lost um, or are going to lose, probably, um, Eastern United Methodist Church. Um, we are, the jury is still out on the White Cat building. Um, there is a, an iconic house called the Bransford House at the corner of 17th and Holly. That, uh, you know, Bransford Avenue, it's the same family. That was the farmhouse and all that got subdi subdivided out and it's, Jury's still out on that one, but we uh, in in that area have lost a lot of very iconic buildings. And the rallying cry for East Nashville, I know it is for the fire department as well, is save the fire hall. So um, whether or not this is true, uh, their allegations are true. There is a, a lack of confidence in Metro government's roofing contractor. Whether or not allegations are true, there's a, there's a lack of confidence that that contractor can handle it or will do it with the care and accuracy that is needed to protect um, one of the oldest operating fire halls in the city. So um, I appreciate uh, Chief Swan being here and uh, working with me and others to do whatever we needed to do to get a tarp on that thing. Um, uh, but that building it has become the rallying cry for the neighborhood of like, this is, this is our stand up against this tornado that we're gonna save this building. Um, what I will ask of all Metro government departments is that um, to the extent that we can expedite a structural examination uh, to determine what level of, what, what kinds of repairs are needed and what, I think that the community is, ready that you could probably do fundraisers to privately pay for it. I mean, obviously I'm gonna to want to use taxpayer dollars for it, just like every other fire hall. But um, it, would, it would be tremendously helpful to the East Nashville community as well as to our affected firefighters who work out of that building to get that building repaired and back and running as quickly as possible. And just wanna make sure that we, um, we, we do what we need to do to get that as, as soon as we can. Chief Swan. Uh, yes, well, we definitely want to thank the community and, and, and definitely you with uh, pushing for it, uh, for that station. And we understand that fire station has became uh, become more than just a fire station. It is a beacon of light and uh, for recovery. And it, what better fitting place to be a fire station. Uh, but uh, we do have full confidence uh, with our general services that will help us um, facilitate, facilitate really getting this back into order. So it's in the early stages, but we're working real close with general services. And I know, because um, I was a part of a lot of the emotions that was running with the uh, getting a tarp over the roof and, and a lot of statements being made, but uh, I assure you that um, I work closely uh, with uh, Nancy Woodmore just to try to get this accomplished. Now, we never can move fast enough. And again, my heart um, was very touched and moved by all of the emotions uh, and everyone wanting to help. Um, you mentioned uh, a few other historical sites there and, and just as important, uh, not that we want to compare ourselves to a church by no means, but 
but just a symbolic meaning of something that's sustainable in a community to uh, represent, uh, again, a beacon of light of recovery. So we're working very closely with uh, general services. And uh, just like you, we want to rebuild and, and probably make it uh, a little bit more usable for modern times because it is a very unique fire station. Uh, even the equipment that we use in that station has to be designed for it. But, but I hope it, that we will work closely with general services and with the mayor's office to, to get it back up and running. So appreciate that. Thank you very much. Well, and I'll just ask that, um, please keep me apprised, because even, even with the, the lack of a tarp on the building, it was like social media craziness until, you know, uh, and until like, I, I'm not gonna believe the tarps here until I actually see the tarp here and the community was similarly motivated. Um, like, you could turn around and one day the building will be rebuilt if, it, if, we, if there's a lack of information of the status of that building on a very frequent basis. So I uh, just asked you, <laughs> uh, please keep me apprised of that. Again, that's one where the, uh, I have a, a very educated constituency in terms of degrees, advanced degrees in engineering, architecture, all of those things. Um, there's a great skepticism about uh, whether that will meet the community standards of, of what the restoration of that building will look like. We will receive a large amount of feedback about that, uh, even, if, even if it was the, the most masterful. But um, it's just, you know, the community wants to make sure that that's done and, you know, frankly is, is ready and available to privately fundraise and get out there with hammers and nails and even do it themselves and, and, and might do that um, if we don't have frequent status updates on that. Yeah, well, I was okay. told that. Trust me, I, I've been very much, of, and I, I want to just thank you, thank you again for that. But again, just in short, and, and not speaking out of turn, but just being the chief of the department, we definitely want to keep that station and want to keep that, um, the historical view and look of it, but we still maybe can masterfully look around the back to have it a little bit more modern. But we'll work closely, and I will keep you abreast with that. So thank you for your concern. Thank you. Um, I really, I, th I think that that uh, has covered the, the major items that I have. Again, I'm really, really fortunate to have very well organized neighborhood associations. And for these affected areas, the East End Neighborhood Association uh, actually has sort of reorganized and I'm meeting with them after this meeting. The East End, most of what you call Five Points is actually in the East End neighborhood. Lachlan Springs Neighborhood Association is very robust and active, financially uh, solvent, great at fundraising, distributing, um, all those th writing grants. The Rosebank Neighbors Group is also fantastic. So the areas that were impacted in District 6 are, are in good hands, and, and I trust my neighborhood presidents as if they were their own, they're the council members of those districts. That's the way I look at it. So all right. appreciate everyone's support. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, council Member Parker. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, First, I, I just want to thank, of course, our uh, first responders who were kind of on the scene immediately, um, and all the metro departments, uh, public works, NES, et cetera, who have uh, worked so diligently to, to restore the Ramsey Street area of my district back to normalcy. Um, also, you know, within hours of the tornado hitting, we had self-organized cleanups. Um, we had hands-on and AMAC, you know, organizing volunteers and sending them there. We had skilled labor being volunteered, you know, tarping roofs, um, boarding up windows and all that. And it's just really incredible to see the community response um, in, in that neighborhood. Um, so we are facing a few issues. Um, we, we still don't have power in a lot of the area along Ramsey Street from, or at least, I haven't been over there yet this afternoon. Um, we still don't have power in a lot of the area. And, you know, so a lot of these residents are already, a lot of these renters are already cost burdened. Yeah. So, you know, going to stay in a hotel uh, for a few days, in addition to having uh, a full amount of rent due, um, you know, the sort of the day when all this hits, that's a, that's a pretty big stretch for a lot of these folks. So. Um, y you know, I, I guess rental assistance comes in there, but uh, I, I would just ask that our our property managers and, and, and private landlords um, have a little grace with people who are maybe struggling with that right now. Um, give them a little leeway and, and give them a little time to figure their 
situation out. Um, uh, the Meg's magnet school was pretty badly damaged. Um, the, those students and educators have relocated to Graymar um, as of yesterday, but the the repairs will be pretty intensive, and um, you know I hope that that we can uh, have that school back up and running uh, as soon as possible, and that we make that a, a capital priority. Um, and uh, you know when when I'm when I'm out talking with folks in the affected area, the the main thing that they're asking is you know a lot of a lot of structures are relatively un, un, unharmed. Uh, people are able to stay in them except for the the power situation. And I know that NES has been um, working really diligently. We had a ton of the out of state contractors. I think it was Elliot from Kentucky. We had a ton of those folks in the neighborhood, um, and um, they 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 handled some pole replacements and whatnot very quickly, but I, I do wonder if NES could provide a, a status update for, for power in the uh, the Ramsey Street area, sort of between 7th and 9th at Parkway Terrace, all that. Yes, that's, that's one of the areas that uh, we've been in somewhat. We hit hard today, and again, that's one of the areas we're expecting to be finished by either 8 o'clock tonight or by noon tomorrow for the customers that can receive power. So uh, that's most of that area will be back on by tomorrow, we're expecting. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's all I have. Uh, I, I share a lot of the concerns and sentiments that um, my fellow council members expressed. Um, and I won't, uh, I won't return those here. Um, but, but thank you for putting this meeting together, Vice Mayor. Sure. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, District 2. Councilor Martins. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. I want to um, reiterate what my colleagues have said in thanking the first responders uh, and all of the various departments that really um, hit the ground running um, almost immediately after the storm ended. Um, I've had I have several residents who were not mobile and had some health issues and. I was able to reach out to Kristen Wilson um, in the mayor's office and she almost immediately got me in contact with someone or reached out to someone in, in OEM and got someone out to all those residents. So I really appreciate that. Um, I want to start with a question about information dissemination. Um, going back to my residents that are not mobile, I have uh, residents who uh, may have mental health issues or or maybe developmentally challenged. So how are we get going to make them aware uh, for those folks who may not understand all of this stuff that's on the internet or may not have access to the internet, or even if they get a flyer, they don't really understand what mm -hmm. it says. How are we helping those folks um, with those issues? And then my folks who are not mobile, who can't, don't have a car, can't get on the bus, like can't leave their place to get to a disaster relief center like can they get all of their assistance via telephone like, like what are we doing for those folks well um, thank you council member it sounds like they should call 311 um, I think uh, for those of uh, those folks who don't have access to a computer who may not be mobile if they can pick up the phone dial 311 yeah. uh, mr. Crumbo uh, that microphone is on if you uh, well it was hold on okay there you go. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, yes, I think 311 is probably the, the best starting point. Um, and alternatively, they could uh, call the Red Cross or the United Way, uh, one of the organizations that is helping with us, and they'll redirect uh, you know, to the uh, resources most needed. Okay, and so for the folks, so that helps the folks who are not mobile, but for the folks who have some comprehension challenges, who may have some developmental challenges, how are we identifying those folks? Is it because I, I know of a, a few of them, but I don't know everyone. So how are we finding out who those folks are so that they can have access to resources as well? So I, I think they would almost have to um, you'd have to get the information out to call for them to call 311, which would then handle the call. But no, no. If if you have someone who's developmentally challenged, they're not going to be able to call 311. So I have like there's a 
some subsidized apartments uh, in the area of my district that was affected. And we went, because we went door knocking, delivering food to folks, and there was one particular residence where it was difficult to communicate with the resident because of the challenges that resident had. And so a neighbor ended up coming over and helping to communicate with that, with that resident. Um, so what assistance is there for those individuals? Chief, Chief Swan? Yeah. Well, um, as I stated earlier, uh, starting tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., we will have our FEMA representatives along with the urban search and rescue teams, and we will be going into those affected areas to do knocking on the doors. So again, if you have um, specific individuals that you know of, uh, individually, you still can report that to 311 and then they'll get it to us so that we can, you know, make sure we don't miss them. But the coning will start tomorrow at 9 a.m. Uh, again, they will be a team made up. It'd be four teams of three individuals. Uh, will FEMA representatives will actually go knock on doors and help them do the actual signing up. And then, as we stated, they can, uh, of course, go to those Nick, uh, brick and mortars, but we will be there. So if you have certain individuals, uh, you still can call yourself and say, hey, these are, you know, if it's Will Swan at 123 address, whatever you, they'll get that to us and we'll make sure we have somebody go out there. So if you come to a residence where it may be difficult to communicate with that resident because of challenges they may have, are you gonna pull in? Like right, other resources, okay. uh, yes. And, and again, okay. and not even speaking out of turn, but I'm, I know we got some representatives in the back, FEMA reps and, and TEMA, but in, interpreters and, and all that stuff that are at the facilities, yes, we would be able to get someone out there to make sure that we'd be able to provide them the information that they need. Okay. Yeah. All right, so um, my colleagues have all mentioned needed, uh, folks needing basically financial assistance. So um, the area of my district that was impacted was all of Metro Center, and then on the other side of Rosa Parks is the Buena Vista Heights neighborhood. And so there wasn't any structural damage, but they were without power for, what, Tuesday, early Tuesday morning to, I think it came on Friday evening for most folks and then everyone else sometime during the, the weekend. Um, so food assistance. Um, some folks, I know that for SNAP benefits, if you're on SNAP benefits, that if you apply within 10 days of the natural disaster, which would have been the third, the deadline would then be the 13th, that you can get emergency uh, food assistance to replenish your groceries. However, everyone doesn't apply, uh, doesn't uh, qualify for SNAP, even though they be, may be living from check to check and struggling to make ends meet. And so lots of folks in my area lost all of their groceries, and so they're gonna need to replenish those groceries. Also, lost wages. Some people couldn't get to their jobs, or they may have taken their families to a hotel and spent um, basically money that they didn't have. They couldn't get to their jobs. Um, they may have taken, since rent was due last week, some folks may have used their rent money to pay for hotels, to pay for eating out because they, their groceries spoiled. And so they're gonna need some type of financial assistance to replace um, those lost wages. And I reiterate to, for my colleagues, to private um, landlords, if you can extend some grace to folks who may not have their rent money because they used it to survive. Um, the tornado. Um, I do want to um, thank certain nonprofits who have been raising money on their own to provide some financial assistance to folks. The, the Equity Alliance, Gideon's Army, um, 200 Man Stand, uh, some churches, Lee Chapel, New Covenant, Greater Hacks Missionary Baptist Church, they've used their own funds and have been doing fundraisers to try to provide this financial assistance that I'm talking about, but um, they don't have the resources to do that long term. And so, um, and that's going to be, and that's an immediate need, because like I said, people have spent money that they really didn't have just trying to make it through. And also, a long term concern is the mental health aspects of folks dealing with this uh, tornado. I saw a lot of tears. 
a lot of folks who are just really mentally impacted by what has occurred. A lot of people are taking care of family members who have been displaced. And so I really would like to know what, if anything, we can do as a city to try to address some of the, the mental health, health impact of the tornado. Like the administration had a comment. Okay. So two things. The mental health um, representatives are at each of the three disaster centers. So the disaster assistance centers do have mental health workers there. Um, the other thing um, regarding the financial assistance, a lot of the emergency financial assistance, you mentioned several that are out there now. There is a coordinated network of short-term emergency financial um, assistance uh, nonprofits. They are Red Cross, Catholic Charities, Rooftop, Needlink, and Salvation Army. There's a sixth, which is Old Hickory, um, but they are for one zip code that is unaffected in this. So those five um, provide um, emergency financial assistance through a coordinated network using Charity Tracker. So it's not an opportunity for folks to go to each one, but rather they will coordinate um, uh, financial assistance among themselves. And do you know what's the turnaround? So if I were to reach out to them today, what would be the turnaround to get some type of assistance? They're for that short-term immediate needs. So okay. I, I can't say that it's on the spot, but it's not a long-term solution. It's a, it's a short-term solution. Okay. Vice Mayor, if you'll indulge me just a moment. Um, sure. For those of you who have not met uh, the woman who's just speaking, it's Mary Jo Wiggins. Uh, Mary Jo had come on board three weeks ago as our new Deputy Director of Finance, and she comes to us after a 15-year stretch as both the CFO and CEO, uh, interim CEO of both the Red Cross and the United Way. So she could not have come along at a better time, and we're thrilled to have her here, and as you can tell already, she's a fabulous uh, resource. So Mary Jo, welcome. Thank you. I think everything has been covered by um, my colleagues, because I also had a concern about folks being able to get to those disaster relief centers, but if the uh, OEM folks are going to go door to door that may remedy that. Okay. okay. All right. Any questions for uh, Councilmember Toombs? Councilmember Taylor? Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I had a question. Is it an opportunity for a centralized website specifically for tornado relief other than Nashville Hub? Um, so the information that we have that are kind of squirreling around everywhere, we can put that in one space. Um, so we can, uh, so if there is a question, we can we can find that and we can link individuals directly to uh, relief opportunities in in Nashville. So obviously, uh, one of the things we're trying to do is focus in on one place to call. So I like the three one one. Been taking notes about what's needed. One of the things is information and centralized information. There's a lot of information out there. I think what we'll do is work with the mayor's office and try to figure out how to put it in one place so you can find it. Um, the storm, the storm water response. So is everything there right yeah. now? So it's okay. rooftop, the rooftop and, and the organizations, all that's there. So he's saying everything's there. It, unfortunately, I just haven't had internet. Okay. So I, yeah. All right. I've been able to see that. So. Thank All right, you. so anything new, we'll make sure to get it to the mayor's office so they can post it. Um, again, taking notes about, uh, you know, do people have access to a computer and can they find it? Do they know how to find it? How do we make sure that it gets to the right place? Uh, Council Member Toombs? Just um, another thing, for folks who need to get to work or wherever, um, is there some assistance with transportation, maybe bus passes or something like that? Yeah, Councilmember Porterfield had mentioned that. Um, so um, I think there is. Chief Swan. At the disaster centers, the brick and mortars, um, uh, WeGo is very generous to giving those 30 day passes to individuals that are, need, that are in need. So again, you can pick those up at the um, brick and mortars three locations, and if that change, and I know that we were in conversation about that, but 
uh, let me verify before I make a statement about that. But we are talking about looking at putting them in different other places for resources. And we'll, so again, we can get them there at the brick and mortar. But right now they're at the discovery. Yes, the uh, disaster, disaster assistance disaster. centers. Sorry. Also, Mr. Vice Mayor, um, <laughs> do we have a timeline for application process to open for the community foundation? But just say that again. The application process for organizations to apply for community foundation funds. Is there a timeline for that to open and to close? Well, so I'm not exactly sure of the process at this point. The community foundation is here. But uh, are you all ready to, to comment on that? If you, if you are, um, just, um, Pat Embry is here, uh, just come on up. Hi, uh, I'm Pat Embry, I'm Director of uh, Media and Community Relations, and uh, I'm joined by Amy Fair, who's our Vice President of Donor Services and uh, knows all things uh, grants and effort. The, the, to your specific point, uh, Council Member, the um, applications open up later on this week. Yes. Later on this week. Okay. That's we, fair. Um, just set up a website called um, tornadoresponse.com where we're putting information. That's where the grant application will live. Our grant manager has been simplifying the grant application that we've used in some recent rounds of grants to really simplify so we can get that information quickly so the nonprofits don't have to do lots of digging for information um, and get the information to us. We have, uh, and uh, we have just, uh, just sent out 27 of these grants uh, yesterday afternoon. Uh, I have a uh, draft news release that we're sending out, plan on sending out uh, mid-morning tomorrow to uh, members of the media Y'all are welcome. I don't normally send stuff out to the council, but I, I presume in this case you'll you'll want these and, and subsequent ones. So I'm I'm ready to read those now, and, and but you don't have to write them all down. We'll, we can pass out. And made, I made 30 copies. So um, it's an alpha order: Backfield in Motion, Community Resource Center, Cumberland Mental Health Services. That's in Wilson County, Donaldson Hermitage Family YMCA. The Equity Alliance, Family and Children's Service, Gideon's Army, Hands on Nashville, Holly Street Daycare, Interdenominational Ministers Fellowship, Jefferson Street United Merchants Partnership, better known as JUMP, Lee Chapel AME Church, Legal Aid Society of Middle Tennessee and the Cumberlands, Martha O'Brien Center, NAACP Nashville, Nashville Food Project, Neighborhood Health Services, Northwest Family YMCA, Project Connect Nashville, Rebuilding Together Nashville, Second Harvest Food Bank, St. Anne's Episcopal Church, Team Rubicon, they're helping out in Putnam County, Tennessee State University, most specifically their Agriculture Department, Urban League of Middle Tennessee, Westminster Home Connection, and World Central Kitchen Incorporated, which is also open out in Putnam County. Uh, those total uh, $810,000. Uh, with, with other funds, we have uh, existing funds at, at the uh, Community Foundation that have, have uh, been designated. We don't make the designations on that, the, the donors do. Uh, we've had well over uh, a million dollars go out the door just uh, just since uh, money started coming in Thursday or Friday. I, I emphasize that these are when when you see these totes and all that, uh, and uh, these are these are pledges, not and commitments. Not takes a while for us to get credit cards to go through and uh, or checks to arrive in the mail and all that. Know that this is just the first round, and we'll have many many more. Um, and to echo what the council member uh, Withers so aptly put, it's a two-year process for a lot of this stuff. So, uh, you know, we're going to stay on it. I have more to talk about about explaining what the Community Foundation is all about. If you all want to listen to it, uh, it's just a couple of minutes. So we um, we actually have asked you to come next week 
okay, to do gotcha. that. Okay. Um, I'll save it for then. Uh, I, because we, I think we will have other council members. Okay. Obviously, we'll have a full council. The, That's uh, correct. The only question I've got is, obviously, you just went through a series of grants. Is it clear what those grants are for with those particular entities, and we'll be able to find that out? We'll ex I, I was going to say, it is for tornado relief. Uh, there was really no other designation. One of the things that we've always said is we are not boots on the ground organization, so we don't want to restrict and limit an organization to what they're able to do or not do. So we say tornado relief, and then once the dust is settled, we'll get information about how they really did apply that so we can put out the information and share with people really how everyone was impacted in the community. Okay, I think um, what we will share with you uh, when we get it um, written out is basically the purpose of this meeting was to try to convey to everybody, in, including the Community Foundation, what people are, are needing. So um, um, basically, I think most people are saying um, they need rental assistance and they need help with that. Uh, rental assistance help, and then those who lost things, they're going to need some help replacing that as well. But um, I guess if um, if people are looking for assistance right away, they should go to one of these organizations. Um, I mean, absolutely, they should go to one of these organizations, or perhaps they've gone to another organization. I know, talking to several nonprofits. Um, that have reached out to us to find out when might we be able to apply, um, that they've gotten many referrals from Metro Social Service um, at the disaster relief centers. Um, so there is a lot of good information that's being passed along at those hubs. Um, so I think it's just a matter. So to give you an example, one organization that supports utilities assistance said that they have in two days um, received $30,000 worth of requests specifically for tornado relief. Um, and those just came in in the last two days. Okay. So there is information flow happening. Um, one of the things sitting in the back, I've been sort of furiously taking notes. One of the things we talked about this weekend when we were in our office, we don't want to burden nonprofits we didn't want to burden them before the application came, became available, we, but we wanted to get some basic information, who's doing what, because even just listening, that really seems to be the missing link. People need something, and they're not sure quite who's doing what. We typically ask the nonprofits that information in a bite-sized detail, but I think sitting here listening to the council members, that there could be value of doing some basic survey of council members to hear really from the ground, because you're hearing from residents that aren't necessarily connecting to the nonprofits. We're hearing from the nonprofits, so how can we connect those two things together? Well, and I think we appreciate that. That's obviously why uh, we're glad you're here. Um, I, I think that's the, we wanna make sure we get that connection. So if, um, if what, uh, who our folks, uh, like Council Member Withers, who's pushing his button, um, are seeing that he needs particular help in his district, if it's Council Member Taylor, um, if it's folks, that, our council members are there to try to figure out and work with the different groups on the field or, you know, in their districts to figure out what is it particularly that folks need. And what we're trying to do is match up between what you all are doing in terms of providing it to not-for-profits and our folks who are telling you um, this is what we need, this is where we are, and again, I think everybody went through, I mean, the main thing that keeps showing up is renters who have now been displaced who are in desperate need of immediate assistance along with, um, I mean, so there were people talking about they're running out of money. I think um, it was either uh, Council Member Roten or Council Member Syracuse are saying like, they're going to churches and saying, I'm out. Uh, and because of the timing, it sounds like they just paid rent last week and now they don't have money to take care of it. So that's what we're trying to quickly figure out what are those immediate needs and how do we connect you and the not-for-profits to what people are saying that they need. We'll just work through that. We'll just keep working through it until we get it right. Councilman Withers. Um, 
Thank you so much, Mr. Vice Mayor. What, um, I greatly appreciate Martha O'Brien uh, among several District 6-based uh, nonprofits uh, being one of the recipients because I know all the great work that they do uh, in, in a number of categories. But in speaking with um, uh, Martha O'Brien CEO, Marsha Edwards, um, one of the things that she said that some of these nonprofits are, are going to need in addition to funding is staffing or FTEs. And I don't know if y'all, you know, just at the, the staffing that a lot of times a nonprofit has barely deals with their ordinary operations. And so for, for them to be able to assist a, a much greater uh, constituency or much more intense need than what they ordinarily do, um, sometimes they need staffing help. And I, don't, I didn't know if you all just had any experience with how that often works uh, in responding to disasters. Um, well, I think part of, you know, in mentioning that these grants were put out and there weren't restrictions on them, that they're for tornado relief, whatever way they see fit, um, the disaster funding uh, looks a little bit different than our traditional grant making. So I think in terms of service delivery, to getting those services to people, um, to have the people to do that work, I don't think that would be prohibited whatsoever. Right. And, and one other thing, Mr. Vice Mayor, and I do apologize if, if I uh, overlook this, but, you know, we uh, has with the displacement, one of the things that I really think about um, is, you know, we also have a census going on and how do we keep track of folks and where they're at? Um, because with the census taking place, if you have displacement, you know, that affects, you know, federal funding and things like that. So has the city really contemplated how we're going to keep track of where people are going to and ensure that they're counted. Anybody, uh, Mr. Crumpo? Yeah, so it's a great question. It's frankly the first time I've heard that question. And um, much like last week when uh, it was the first time I was hearing about the Community Foundation and the Memorandum of Understanding, uh, the best I can do tonight is tell you I'm glad to look into that. And it, it's something that impacts the metro government. We'll see it through. If it needs to go somewhere else, I'll let you know that uh, as well. And uh, as long as I have the microphone, I do want to express a very sincere thanks from the administration to the Community Foundation. Uh, it was just last Thursday evening, uh, you know, just, just after we're all starting to assess the damages there that I was in this council chamber and asked about the uh, community foundation and promised that I would contact the director and I did that. Uh, Ellen Lehman was extremely responsive to me, uh, met over the weekend. The folks that are here f have formed uh, their committee, at least begun to. They've started to set and forward uh, application processes and things that you're hearing about now. So many thanks for the speedy response on that. I know you'll be back next week with a more full report, particularly after hearing the needs of the council tonight. And uh, the vice mayor and I spoke a couple times the last few days. I know he's been very concerned about moving money from the community foundation to a deployment level status. Um, I think he and I both recognize that your charge is Middle Tennessee, not just Davidson County. So uh, our gratitude uh, many times over for considering Davidson County and working with us on all things tornado relief. It's really, truly appreciated. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Crumbo. Um, Councilmember Taylor, any other comments? I've still got you listed. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Evans. Thank you. Uh, a couple of quick questions. First of all, on the, um, the website that's maintained by the city, the, uh, I forget what it's called, the Metro Storm Response Information. Is there, um, I, I'm looking at it right now, so there's a lot of good information, but it doesn't feel, I guess, as intuitive. Is there an opportunity to maybe add some like FAQs or something like that um, of some of these common questions that we're getting, like where do I go for rental assistance and that kind of stuff just to kind of uh, start to point people. I think the information's on the page, but you have to spend a little bit of time reading. Um, and most people don't like to do that. So is there opportunity for that? There's always opportunity for better things. Correct, Mr. Jameson? He gave his head. Okay, he good. His head. I saw that yes. head nod. And then the other, since the other two questions that popped up, on the um, Community Foundation, will you all, based on, I guess, what you have heard today from what we're talking about with runner's assistance and that kind of thing, Will, will you, as part of your process, also source nonprofits? Like, will you go, hey, these are the, all the ones that are doing renter's assistance, or, or is that something we can drive your way as part of this conversation? Yes, because there are, a num just like Mary Jo said, there are a number of organizations that are doing things in a very coordinated mm -hmm. way. And even on the transportation, there are, 
is a nonprofit coalition that's interested in transportation for a particular audience, but I wonder if what they've learned in their sort of structure and organization could be used temporarily for the people that are affected by the tornado. So I think there are, again, people out there doing things. We just need to apply them to the places that need them the most. Yeah, I'm thinking about, I guess, on the Donaldson Hermitage area, the whole conversation we were having about coordinating some of the faith-based groups and nonprofits out there that if we can get them to a good point where there's some of that coordination, maybe we'll have a better idea of, you know, this is where you can go for these things. And Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. Great. And we, just to give you one example, um, the nonprofit Rooftop was actually born out of an effort of churches to collaborate for people to have one stop shop for assistance on rental, essentially the homeless prevention structure. Um, and so they have a great relationship with a number of churches, know how to work with churches, know the personality of churches. And so certainly um, we know the director there, we've uh, supported them through our traditional grant making in some other ways and say, hey, you guys have really good relationships with churches. Could you deploy in the Donaldson community and maybe help this group of people get together? Okay. And then I guess, uh, since I haven't um, contributed to the foundation before, um, residents who want to make a donation can designate Davidson County only for their contributions? If they would like to do that, there is the Metro Disaster Response okay. Fund, which is exclusively Davidson County. Um, so they could put it in that bucket as well. Got it. Thank you. And then the last thing I wanted to say is kind of related to the census. So at DHNA, the uh, neighbor, our meeting last night, you know, we had the census speaker. Um, and so that person talked specifically about what you're saying. So residents are supposed to identify where they're staying for the count. And then they're going to do some special campaigns and everything related to. No, it won't be where they really live. It'll be where they are on April 1st. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Council Member Porterfield, anything else? I heard you sneeze back there. Thank you. I made sure to sneeze in my elbow. Thank so you. I did not spread any germs to anyone. Um, thank you so much for acknowledging me, Vice Mayor. I know that my area was not uh, impacted, but I believe that all of our council members have been all hands on deck working around the clock to try to support areas that were impacted. Um, one question for the um, foundation. You mentioned the first round of uh, people that, that were would have funds dispersed and uh, I think that's a very wonderful and comprehensive list. I'm very excited about that, that list that you all share. So thank you um, for sharing that. For any of those organizations, do they know when they will actually receive funds or how they will receive them? They all have been communicated with um, from our grants manager. We, in the last couple of years, have attempted to get nonprofits, particularly those in the community um, where we give on a regular basis on an ACH protocol so that we're just transferring money electronically to their account. Um, I believe 24 of these 27 were already set up on ACH. Um, three of those that were not, um, we have contacted them to get the information, but we decided, you know, they're a little busy. Um, so let's go ahead and just get them a check and we'll try to figure out how to get it to them as quickly as possible. Um, but uh, they've all been communicated with, let them know, particularly the ACH folks, that the money will hit their account in the next couple of days, um, but they've all been informed. Thank you, and then my, my thank you so much for that information. And then uh, I had a follow-up question, uh, Vice Mayor, on um, mm -hmm. uh, Brandon's question and Aaron's suggestion. It was going back to the um, disaster relief page on the national.gov website, and I, I think that it does have a lot of great information, but is there a way that people can submit information. Uh, for example, what, uh, what Council Member Withers shared with us about this um, entity that is doing free cleanups and drywall removal and removing trees, um, or the, the Tennessee Realtors Association. Right now they are giving out um, $1,000 for rental, insurance, uh, rental assistance, excuse me, by people that were impacted, and you can go on their website and apply for free. Those type of things are not on the national.gov site, and I understand they're not, they're not um, related to us uh, particularly, but is there a way that we can vet some of these relief efforts and put them on the national.gov website so if we're asking people to go to one place that they truly are going to one place 
and can see these uh, different efforts. Mr. Jameson. That is a great idea and suggestion, Councilor Lady Porterfield. And yes, we are taking input from all comers. So we have added information that is included on that information sheet from both metro departments and agencies and private entities. And if you'll just send those to me at the council office website, I'm sorry, the mayor's office website, sorry, force of habit, uh, we'll make sure we add those to the information sheet that, again, is at the top of the homepage of the metro.gov uh, website. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Council Member Sawara. Thank you, Vice Mayor, and thanks to everyone that's been working on this. Um, quick question for the Community Foundation. I was listening to the list of uh, organizations. I wanted to know, is there any that actually service the Hispanic community? There is a, a, a location right there in, uh, in Hermitage that is a lot of immigrants that are impacted by the uh, tornado, um, and a lot of them don't speak English, and so do we have organization that works with that community specifically? Absolutely, I think the best resource um, for that is Conexion. Um, they just put out an incredible bit of information about all of the services that they offer in terms of translating um, information uh, from Metro about the services into Spanish language. They also provide um, Spanish language on the hotline, and they are doing a number of services of really doing outreach as well as having people come to Casa Azafran on Nolensville Road. Um, but I know that they're getting out in the community, um, getting into the pockets where there are particular Hispanic communities. Um, so they would be probably the absolute best resource for that. I, 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 I know about Conexion, and so I did not hear their name in the list. I wanted to know if we're working with any organization, so that's what prompted the question. Um, and to Chief Swan and everybody working at the center, um, do we know the type of question where they're asking people uh, before they receive help? Because again, for the immigrant community, uh, a lot of people, so I'm trying to make sure they're not asking about status and things like that. So have we ensured that is that a conversation that we've had? Uh, because we want to make sure people are coming to us for assistance and not worried about anything else. Chief Swan. Uh, so you, in short, I wouldn't be able to give you a clear answer only with the disaster recovery and trying to get out into the communities. As I stated earlier, we're going to be working pretty closely with FEMA, uh, and that will be our fire and police. Uh, representatives, but um, we, and someone asked a question pertaining to the Census uh, uh, Bureau. Uh, we've actually reached out to them and we're trying to set something up so we have a better understanding pertaining to that. So um, probably if you would, Zerafat, if you want to reach out to me personally and then uh, these are good questions because again, sometimes uh, as Kevin stated, uh, we don't think about some of the questions that uh, your constituents are bringing to you, and of course you're doing your job, and we appreciate that. But I will assure you that we are very much concerned about that because we don't want anybody feeling as if you know they're being targeted or uh, you know as some type of a, a trick in the mix or some sort. We're we want to make sure we treat everybody fairly and make sure we have a representative there for interpretation or uh, interpret interpreter. So again, if you want to reach out to me, I'll be more than happy to uh, address that person. And, and then we can bring it back to the council as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Roden. I was just going to tell Zofat that uh, TIRCC, I have a neighborhood that there was a lot of non English speaking people in the area, and TIRCC went out with a group of people to make sure they were taken care of and that they had people that could speak to them in their language. So I just want to let you know that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the other thing I would say. Too, besides Turk, um, another great group is Tennessee Justice for Our Neighbors, and they're working with folks that um, perhaps their immigra immigration documentation has been lost and working with services to assist them in, in getting additional documentation and, and getting that updated. Okay. All right. Uh, um, that's everybody in the queue. Any other questions for anybody here tonight? Um, so we have, um, so uh, 
uh, we have one other person who wants to speak. Community Foundation, uh, we certainly appreciate you being here, and uh, we've invited you to be back here next Tuesday night for the full council meeting. It starts at 6.30. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Vice Mayor. I'm Stuart Anderson with FEMA. I'm Intergovernmental Affairs uh, Manager. That's a very large word for a liaison that works with local elected officials. Um, I'm just here to uh, reiterate, uh, I believe Chief Swan already talked about the uh, disaster recovery centers, the brick and mortar stuff that's opening up. Uh, they'll be open Thursday. Uh, the um, particular places, yeah, I wrote it, there we go. Uh, the, the main thing, they don't have to visit those places. They can do it on disasterassistance.gov. They can call 1-800-621-3362 or 1-800-621-FEMA. Uh, or they can download FEMA app and do it that way too. Or if they visit one of the centers, if they visit one of the mobile centers, if the, one of the uh, disaster survival assistance teams that are gonna be outcoming the area, they can do it through them. So there's multiple ways that folks can get registered. And that's, that's FEMA's main focus right now is getting uh, the survivors registered and uh, get them into the, the, the FEMA side of the system in cooperation with uh, our, our aggressive partnership, if you will, um, with the state and local folks uh, and volunteer organizations that just uh, spoke and that to get the survivors what they need. Okay. Uh, the other thing is um, I planned on emailing all of you and will, unless you just want me to give you my my information. Uh, yeah, if, if you don't mind uh, going ahead and giving it to us. Sure. Okay. It's uh, my email is Stuart.Anderson, and that's spelled S T E W A R T dot A N D E R S O N at FEMA dot DHS dot gov. Okay. And my phone number is 609. 508-2394. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. And again, I'm your liaison, if you will. Are you, uh, are you gonna be here, uh, are you here for uh, the duration, at least for a while? I, I had a previous commitment to take my wife on a trip in May, <laughs> but other than that, for a week or so, and I don't know if that's gonna pan out either. But, we, but if I'm not here, there'll be somebody here. But that's just, I'm going to be here, I'm planning on for the next couple months, maybe a slight hiatus and then back, but there'll be somebody here do, do for we need, you. Do we need to call your wife and uh, tell her that you're going to be needed Oh, she's going to be so angry when I tell her about this. Okay. Uh, no. <laughs> um, so the reason I'm asking you, Mr. Anderson, is that um, the full council meets next Tuesday night at yes, 630. Yes, sir. Yes, and um, if, if you're available and you can be here, just in case we have questions, that would be wonderful. I should be able to be here. 6.30 p.m. tomorrow night in this exact room, okay? Did I say Tuesday? I thought I said, I thought I said Tuesday night. I did the first time. Okay, next, a, a week from today? A week from today. Okay. I may be around tomorrow, but you don't have to come for that, okay? So a week yes, from uh, tonight, Tuesday night, 6.30 p.m. in the chamber. Okay. I'll be, be glad to be there. Thank All you. Right, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Well, before I tell you who I am, if he can't make it, trust me, somebody else from FEMA will make it to whatever you need. Trust me. Absolutely. So my name is Latanya Channel. I am your state director for Tennessee for the U.S. Small Business Administration, another federal agency that works hand-in-hand -hand with FEMA in times of a disaster. Um, my office is here in Nashville, and I live in Old Hickory. So let me tell you how you can use me. I literally this morning met with, I don't know if it's his boss or his boss's boss. It is the, the, the uh, head of FEMA who is on the ground right over here at Metroplex, and we are working hand in hand. So here's how you can use me. If you are having community meetings, whether it's with churches, whether it's in your community, whether it's with the council, and you need SBA or you need FEMA there, let me know. Within two hours, we can have somebody there. Also, I don't know if the Community Foundation has left. You guys are still here, great. Also confirmed with the FEMA head that for those nonprofits that are actually on the ground 
and that the community actually knows. If you need the FEMA people with you, and if you need the SBA people, come on up, uh, with you because they trust those on the ground nonprofit organizations and they may not trust the federal government, we can connect a FEMA person and an SBA person, one or both, to be there as they canvas as these community meetings are happens, whether it's, whether it's in churches, in larger halls, or you're canvassing. Okay, so use me for that. Let me look at my notes real quick. Um, so real quick, so what does SBA do in times of disaster? Um, some, many of you have seen me usually out in the community, whether it's here locally or around the state, talking about SBA's three C's, which are counseling, contracting, and capital. But in times of disaster, this is the one time where SBA goes above and beyond to just helping small businesses. So SBA is around for long-term recovery. So if it is a large business or a small business, there are loans available. Yes, we're talking about loans, and right now when we're trying to uh, get people help, no one wants to talk about a loan. But here's what you have to understand. We need our citizens, we need our business owners to register with FEMA. Register with FEMA. If they cannot get to one of the disaster assistance centers, if they, their neighborhood is not, doesn't have someone canvassing, call the 1-800-621-FEMA number. 1-800-621-FEMA, 1-800-621-FEMA, in addition to 311, okay? Because they can start getting that assistance and getting those dollars into the residents' hands for rental assistance, to replenish their food, for helping getting another car. It's a whole list of things. The state gets, gets resources to our unemployment office. So if you're an employee who can't get to work, you can get unemployment in times of disaster. If you're a business owner who's self-employed, you can get unemployment in times of disaster. So there's a whole list of resources available, and I'm looking for my notes. I'm still, okay, here we, here we go. So um, again, if you need FEMA, SBA, one or both to any community meeting, let us know, let me be your conduit for that or contact directly the FEMA people who you've already made connections with. Ultimately, I wanna get out of the way, so once you're introduced to the FEMA people, once you're introduced to the SBA people who are here on the ground, you won't have to see me and I can go back to my regular SBA job, right? So last night at Lee Chapel, we had an SBA person there, we had a FEMA person there, and as of this morning, the SBA person who was there last night will be the connection with Lee Chapel for the duration. Here's the thing, if residents are not registering with FEMA, business owners, small and large, and citizens and victims, we won't know as the federal government that the help is still needed. And that's Davidson County, Wilson County, and Putnam County. So that registry is vital, okay? Please make sure your, your constituents know and we can make this, uh, we can, we can, uh, uh, make this clear when we come to those community meetings that you asked us to come to, there is a process, right? It is the federal government. So there is a lot of paperwork. There is a process. We currently have FEMA and SBA folks at each one of those disaster assistance centers. We also have a business recovery center on Jefferson Street. At any moment's notice, we can open up another business recovery center in East Nashville. We have commitment from five locations to help businesses specifically recover. But again, wherever SBA is, wherever FEMA is, no matter what the center is, you can get assistance from SBA and FEMA. Let me look at my notes and make sure I've covered everything. Uh, 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 I think I have. So LaTanya Channel, my mobile number is 615-500-5000. That's my work mobile. My email is latanya, L-A-T-A-N-Y-A, dot channel at sba.gov. The vice mayor has my personal cell. I'm not saying on this microphone. <laughs> but again, we need to get the word out to the community how FEMA and SBA work hand in hand. There's a lot of paperwork back and forth. If you don't get approval from SBA or FEMA, you go back to the other one and you might get approval. Um, it's important that business owners know that if they get approved for a loan from SBA, they don't have to immediately use it. They can still consider their options for six months and hold on to that check, and there's no penalty to them. So we can get the word out. Let me shut up because he needs to speak because, again, I need to get out the way and let you all know that these folks are in your community. So Ms. Channel, questions uh, for me before uh, I move? Yeah, what are you doing next Tuesday night at 630? I'll be here. Okay, good. If you need anybody else here, we'll make them here. All SBA right, thank and FEMA. you. Gotcha. Thank you. No problem. 
Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Thami M. Choudhury, uh, Small Business Administration, Public Affairs Assistant, excuse me, Public Affairs Specialist. I've already given you uh, my card, sir, but if anybody else is interested, I am the Public Affairs Specialist assigned to this county. Um, I'm also spreading the same word, that please register with FEMA. We work hand in hand. If FEMA refers your case, as in if you're a homeowner or a renter, if FEMA refers anyone to us, please fill in the forms, because this is how we make people whole again. Our interest rates are as low as 1.56% for homeowners and renters. Um, the repayment timeline may go up to 30 years. It really goes to your advantage if people fill this in. I cannot stress that enough. People hear the word loan, they get scared off. I'm trying to spread that word out. And of course, there are also businesses and nonprofits I'd like to personally visit and explain how we can help with low interest long-term loans. If anyone is interested, I will definitely pass out my cards. I know it's been a long evening already, so I'll just conclude with saying um, I do plan on being here during the tenure of this uh, disaster recovery. If I'm not, I'll give all of you my uh, the incoming public affairs specialist uh, contact. Thanks for your time. Thank you. One final thing, use me if there are problems. I got a phone call yesterday that a business went to our business recovery center at Jefferson Street and one of the SBA people said, I did not have my login. That person is gone as of today. And that business owner will have a phone call and have one-on-one -on -one assistance so they can get through to SBA disaster assistance. I got another phone call about a community, not in Davidson County, was concerned, and this was from a congressperson, that FEMA was not there. Taken care of today because I just sat with their boss. So use me as that conduit for any complaints or any concerns from Davidson to Putnam and all the way to the surrounding counties. Okay? Thank, thank you very much. I believe that's it. Nobody else in the queue. Thanks everybody for being here. Particularly appreciate all the council members for telling us what you need in your areas. That's great. We're going to write it out and um, just keep letting us know. All right. Thank you all to the mayor's office as well and the department heads uh, and all the associations and groups out in the back. Um, we stand adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.